Welcome to the MO Show <laughs> with Michael Patterson. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. that was. You nailed that one. I'm going to use this as my uh, NPR application <laughs> one day. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, I think you have how are you guys' uh, levels? Good? Good for me. Sounds good, yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you sound much sexier than all of us, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll turn myself down a little bit so I don't steal too much. <laughs> yeah. He's got the controls. He can put the bass in his. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I did. He's yeah, that's what I did. I just bumped the bass on me and yeah. lowered it on you. Oh, yeah. Cut it out on us. <laughs> All great. We got EQ'd out. <laughs> All good. So. Yeah, Do you love that this this show is is called M and O? Like I can't express the <laughs> joy I have that it's called the M and O show. Dial, you know, dial M and O. That's right. John d- usually doesn't let me ask a lot of questions before like we meet with people, so I'm just gonna have to start this off. Like, I know your background. Yeah. I know John's a little bit. Um, <laughs> how did like where was the internet section where you guys met? I don't know who wants to start. I'll go. Okay. I was in New York making records, and I forget who reached out. I know my manager reached out and was like, hey, there's this band, there's a single, um, and I think it was Heaven and a Half Pipe that we were working on there, because I fondly remember working in the studio at Puffy Studio, and then walking down to dinner, the Italian restaurant down the street and having dinner, and being like, I love these guys. Like, I just met them. I'm like... Just great energy. Again, Wait, it comes back to energy. You, so you, you guys met. Yeah. Yeah. And then you were, you were assigned. Your manager's like, do you want to pick this up? Or mm-hmm. how's that work? <laughs> um, I can't remember the exact situation, but it was, I think we met in the studio. Yeah. First. And it was like, hey, mix this song. Okay. So, so my version of it, which it, it aligns, but from, from our perspective. Um, so... Uh, I briefly was telling you about it earlier, but we, we basically, we, when we were getting signed, we kind of went into um, a bit of a, you know, like a bidding war. And, um, yeah, is that good? Yeah. So, um, and then as it turned out, kind of the two leading contenders for getting OPM was Electra and Atlantic, which were both under the WIA umbrella at the time, Warner, Electra, Atlantic. So they didn't want them to kind of outbid each other. So they kind of, you know, worked out whatever. We ended up going with Atlantic. And then um, I think sort of like as a caveat to uh, Josh Deutsch from Elektra, they let him produce. I didn't know that was what had, what had happened, but that makes that, sense. That yeah. makes perfect sense. So, so Josh, obviously, New York guy. Um, they had us go to New York which didn't make any sense for us because we were Southern California people. <laughs> what, what time of the year was it? It was going into winter. Okay, yeah, yeah. I feel like it was like November. Yeah. So, yeah, well, actually, when we met you, that's, was... That's November for Southern California people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, so they, so they, they, we were about to break for the uh, Thanksgiving break, and they're like, hey, so we were working on like five or six songs with Josh, we wrote a song called Fish Out of Water because we were fish out of water in New York. Like, we felt very much out of our element. It was really all bizarre. Right. And then they're like, let's let's mix, just let's just mix Heaven as a Half Pipe, make sure we got it before we break, and then we'll resume again next year. And they were like, we're going to get, like, you know, and then we were in these meetings, and they were talking about, you know, who are we going to get to mix, who are we going to get to mix it, and, like, the hottest mixer on the planet <laughs> was working at Puffy's, play you know doing records with Puffy, Michael Patterson, huh. like let's get Michael Patterson to mix it, and we're like, let's go. Okay. We went, we walk in, 
to like the place where like Biggie was just sitting in the chair, <laughs> you know, like not that long ago. And Michael's in there like just, you know, running the show in this amazing studio in Manhattan. It was just, you know, to us, the whole thing was very surreal. And Had you been in New York before to Manhattan? No, never. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so my first experience was, was that, um, you know. So did you engineer Heaven is a Half Pipe and mix it? or He mixed. Oh, you mixed. mixed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He mixed. But then in that time, we met with him, and then he killed the mix, and um, and we got to spend time together. And then we're like, yeah, we're you know talking about going back, you know, back to LA uh, for the break. And he's like, oh, I live in LA. And we're like, oh, okay, <laughs> that, that, that's weird. <laughs> and he's like, we should, you know, let's link up when we get back to LA. And then, and then Johnny's like, come by my studio, MNO. My studio so was the, called MNO. The oh, MNO okay. saga started then. Yeah, that was the beginning. I'm like, I love this. This is great. And you know, at the time, MNO, his studio, there was the studio, there was the spotlight at the corner, yep. which was. I think someone explained very well as <laughs> when you're a convict coming out of prison and you're gay, you go to the spotlight and have a drink. And then there's like four. <laughs> right of the, when you get out. And there were four <laughs> other bars that were like dive bars. And this is before. That's a very specific. <laughs> yeah. This is before anything happened in Hollywood. Like being in the center of all of that. And yep. then three or four years later, all of a sudden, it's all fancy bars everywhere. It was right. an amazing time to, A, be making a record with Johnny at M&O. And just that whole, the whole uh, um, set of Hollywood, I think, played into yeah. the making of that mm. record, which ended up being one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Seriously? Yeah, ab absolutely. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, when you think about all the stuff we went through, all of the fun, all of the arguably time wasted, but it's all <laughs> part of the process. Yeah, uh, that's that's actually a question I have for you yeah what is like the process like is there a typically a bunch of wasted time it do depends. you just have to build that in I mean do you just have to build that into like your you do but you know recording changed at some point there was a you know I think about um, oh my god uh, Miles Davis bitches brew Miles Davis bitches brew was recorded Thursday Friday Saturday from 10 30 a.m. to 1 p.m. three days in a row they just got in the studio and they just played, right? right. And then you had getting in a studio, and I think about a Bi Michael Beinhorn, uh, <laughs> for months and months and months of working and fine tuning stuff. And then you eventually shifted to artists having their own studios and being able to say, I'm gonna spend part of my budget, I'm gonna buy gear, and I'm going to spend as much time as I want. And the financial pressure's off a little bit. Right. So in this case, the band had a studio and we could just sit in there and create and go down all these different paths. Right. So it's it, it actually is pretty interesting looking at that time period in music where you shifted from having to have a studio to not and then convincing labels and such that this is actually a good thing. Which mm. sometimes it's not because you end up, you know, playing Halo and things like that. <laughs> for, you know. Which we did play Yeah. Like I mean, you were pretty fresh. Yeah. Like a, a couple of you guys were fresh and then the other there's a couple that were pretty what, studio musicians or like no, I don't know what you'd call them. I mean, Jeff, the bass player Jeff and was, drummer uh, were. No, they didn't even come till after. Oh, they didn't the come record, till after yeah. the record. We okay. never played one show until after this. So you guys were all fresh. Uh, well, I mean, like uh, Matthew had had been writing songs for a long time, was in a couple of different bands, and Jeff had been playing bass and or guitar in a bunch of bands Love around Jeff, right. Hollywood for you know, a lot of time, okay. but none of us, uh, and I think Matthew had had a little bit of uh, studio experience, right? Um, but yeah, for me, no, I was 1000%, this is a brand new experience. So for you, let's say, maybe more on the engineering side, like, do um, you prefer more fresh artists, or do you prefer more, like, they're on their eighth album, or what? It, what is it, what do you, you know what I mean? It depends. I prefer fresh because there's the, you're, you see the excitement and you're going through the experience while they are. Because mm -hmm. there's definitely like the jaded people who are like, I'm here giving my, like, let's just do our parts. And that right. actually is great, right? But there's also the, oh, look at that. 
This is the part where we say, let's drink some beer. Here. Um, I'm down we should, we should. Thank you, Stephen and Brian. Can we? W- we should you. work on doing that in harmony. Ready? No, I don't. One, I can't. Two, I can't do three. harmony. I'd Let's drink some beer. <laughs> Let's drink some beer. I, I'd need a starting Let's note, and then I'd end up just doing the exact same thing that you did. Okay. All right, ready? On three. One, two, three. Let's, Let's drink, drink some, some beer. beer. Mm, that was horrible. That was bad. But it was fun. <laughs> uh, I didn't even. I didn't um, even go in. So also. We'll mix, so can we mix that in later? We can just auto tune everything. Yeah, we'll auto tune. Yeah. I did. <laughs> that's why I did three layers, so you could auto tune each and then cool, layer cool. them. I got okay. the individual tracks. I could throw auto tune cool. on right now if you'd like. Perfect. Um, so, um, sorry to interrupt you, by no, the way. No. But the beer, we're gonna, we're just gonna. Jeff's gonna yes. explain how we do the beer drinking game. Yeah. And then uh, we'll kind of just sip, but we'll we'll con- jump right back into our conversation. Okay. So, the beer drinking game. Yeah. Your goal, we're going to take two of these beers. Obviously, two are a different color than the other two. So we're going to take, you can see it says THBC, Tarantula Hill Brewing Company. Mm-hmm. Um, let's start with these two. These are our so, very goth-influenced uh, flight boards, by John, the way. John, you want to go? Uh, I, you, I, John, I, know, I made these for you, Mike. Well, I'm, I have to say, touching them and looking at them, I'm so imp- <laughs> Like, with everything here in in the, the restaurant brewery, like, the attention to detail is so good, but this is incredible. Thank you. I know you would appreciate so it, that. So if you notice, it has a cross on it. Okay. So we're going to start with the light and go to the dark for real. So, so T. So we're going to do T tea. and H. Yep. And the goal of this, just for you, is one of these is a tarantula hill beer and one is a guest tap. And so your your goal is just to try to figure out which one you think is tarantula hill and which one is the guest tap. And if, if you if you guess on this one and, and win on the next one, then there's a huge prize that you get Josh's get car. low end on my <laughs> microphone. <laughs> you, get, you get the bass bumped in your mic, yeah. Now, how would you describe a tarantula hit? What is the, what goes into making the beer? What is so, the description? So I would just, Not of these, but just in general. With, I would go with this. Is you felt the energy of this place, so you should be able to find the energy of, of the beer. <laughs> All right. Now he's, he's, he's gonna, trying to get me from stopping. I will. I would give you every time I John, blow it. And I would a, give you actual. John's clues. not allowed to touch the beers while we talk. <laughs> John's like the tarantula's on the right. So go ahead, okay. go ahead and sip. You don't have to. Before I sip, energetically filling the gl- feeling the glasses, I'm gonna say that the tea is that. Now I'm gonna take that out now, and I'm just gonna base it upon taste. Okay, so right. taste for a while, and I got I got a question. That's kind of basic from my perspective, but I kind of want your persp- like your your uh, definition of three roles. From your perspective, what is the role of the engineer, the mixer, and the producer? Like from your definition, good questions. And I think they are actually genre dependent, right? Oh, this is great. <laughs> That's what I wanted. Okay. Because if you are looking at hip hop, I'm the person making the beats, and I am. Here's my sample, Johnny. Do you like? Here's ten tracks I'm playing you, and you're like, oh, four, five, and six are dope. Let me put some, some Is that lyrics the engineer? on that. That's the producer in hip hop. Oh, right? that's the producer in yeah. hip hop. And then in rock, it could be that. It could be someone who is hands on, or it could be the other side. And this is where it gets interesting as well. Someone like Rick Rubin, who is like, I'm hanging out in the studio and I'm observing, and I'm a vibe person, right? And that same person obviously is making hip hop. Right. But obviously, it's more just in a, hey, I'm hanging out, and I'm facilitating, in a way, the vibe, because on a Red Hot Chili Peppers record, we're oh. spending three or four months rehearsing, and then only two weeks in the studio, because we know it so well. But we've worked out everything before, where it's just execution. Okay. And there's some people who are like, let's just go in the studio and record for eight months, and we'll piece it together. So, so, it really so what's depends. the definition of the producer, though? Let's, say, let's just say rock. Like, what is their role? Like, how do they... When they're in the studio, what do they do? Well, they're helping the artist find the best songs, okay. like pick the best songs, develop the arrangements, right. make facilitating so like the with recording. Rick Rubin, like Imagine Dragons and uh, Red Hat Chili Peppers, mm-hmm. that he just did both of those, which I would love to get into because they're double albums back to back six months later, which is kind of unique thing going on. So well, I want to ask you about that. Um, but he, so pick the songs. I think both of those cases, they came in with like 70 or more mm-hmm. songs. Um, and then I also heard that his he was really playing a role in trying to make sure that they really believed in what they were 
creating. It's, that's half the battle, I think. The producer, yeah. I would say, is in a lot of ways um, like the director of a film, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. The producer's the director. Yes. And then you have, you know, the guys who are so running, like, running the cameras. Run that again and do this in a, try it yeah. this way. Yeah. And they're, and basically, like, if you, it's kind of easier to think of it, I think, with film yeah. in the fact that, like, they're sitting there and they're watching the screen as the guy's doing it and they're and they'll say keep doing it take up nope, do it again do it again do it again until they see the take right and it's the Got same it. with like the okay. director and the producer and the, when you're doing the thing we're doing take over take over take and then you know he's sitting there saying as the producer He's saying, okay, we got the take, move on, let's do it again, or let's do the next part, or whatever. The film director analogy is really good, because I, I think of it in the departments of a film, where it's like, here's the writing, here's the script, and here's the input on yeah. that. Here's the, you know, everything from the cinematography, which we'd argue is the recording and the vibe of that. Like, there's a vision there that working hand-in-hand -hand with the artist is what you would see as the end result. You know, again, hip-hop is the, a lot of times, the writer, all of it is the the um, the producer but in a rock way definitely the director and the yeah. film and having the different areas and combining and what he sees on the film and that being the end result is uh, is definitely appropriate yeah. and then I want to go back to you know still along this line but like back to that time when when we met Michael and um, so at that time in in that era of of rock music basically the mixer the mixer role and I and I you know so so prior to my me being in a band or starting this band basically I was in the music industry I worked at Island Records and I worked for Mar Moira Marie Entertainment which was which was you know aside from his manager who he didn't mention where but there was two the two biggest managers of producers in the industry at that time was mm. was Moira Marie and his manager at Sadie that time. Robertson, who just passed away sadly. Oh, that's mm. sad. Yeah, he started the business of it in, yeah. the, in like the early 80s, but they were the two. They were the two, you know, they, they had everybody. And so in that in that era, like, they wanted you to be mixing because you were mixing, you were making, you know, 10 grand a day, just bam, 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 every day. They wanted and then the producers getting, mixing? They wanted anyone who was on their roster to be mixing. Okay because they made so much more money. Where right? a producer may spend two weeks or eight months on a record with this fee, as a mixer, you can say, I'm mixing this album in 10 days, and that's 10 songs, and then you go on and on. Yeah. So between oh, wow. royalties and fees, that's a... So yeah. Yeah. 10 grand a song? That's 100 grand guaranteed in 10 days. Whereas like if you, if you would have got hired at that time, like a producer fee was somewhere between 30 and 100 grand to do a record, which what? could take... A month plus they get a little the, they get a percentage right like they get, they get you get more, you would get more points as a producer but it's it's you know more guaranteed so, money up front probably, exactly right? like <clears throat> so as a manager you want the money up front yeah yeah but anyways he was killing it in as as a mixer like he was literally at that in that era he was you know he was mixing back and you know okay you were yes so you is that right mm. in the when you came over and working with these guys, is that in your transition when you went from New York back to L.A.? Yes, because I was doing all the bad boy stuff, went to L.A. for a bit to do I heard you back to, record. I heard you planned to go back for a little bit and come back and forth, and then next thing you know, you like signed up for a gig that made you just stay in L.A., is that right? Which was OPM. That was what I was trying to get to. Yeah. And keep in mind, Here's the here's the choice he I a, made. He took a big fucking risk by saying he. They, everyone was telling him just wait, just mix whatever, and he was like, he was like, no, I want to fuck, I want to hang out with these guys and produce this record. I, I read an article today, doing a little research. Yeah. And it didn't say OPM, but it said you you were planning like a month back and forth or two months back and forth. Puffy and I, there was a period in New York where I was doing a lot of other stuff for Puffy. And we were out in L.A. and at some point he was like, hey, I want you more involved in the business stuff I'm doing. And I was like, okay, that's great because I've always been, I think, like Johnny, business-minded, seeing seeing the bigger picture more right. than just the record. Excuse me, the, the beer is hitting me. <laughs> um, the, so I came out to do the Beck record and was maybe in L.A. for two weeks and then just one day bought a Saab, bought a car. <laughs> and called my girlfriend at the time, guy. Sob guy, 
called Christine and I was like, I just got a car and she's like, thank God I'm coming out there because she didn't like the weather of New York. Mm. So she came out, we got a place and my, at the time I was like, Puffy, I'm going to do two weeks in LA, two weeks in New York and I'll go back and forth. And then I immediately was presented with the option to do two records. Oh. One record and I'd already met the guys, uh, was OPM, you know, hung out. And then I'd been hanging out with this band called Hybrid Theory. And they were looking for a producer. And in the end, it came down to me and Don Gaiman. Now, they quickly changed their name to Linkin Park. And one would argue, like, oh, we should have a Linkin Park <laughs> record. And my thing at the time was, and it was also, I mean, it was like just like a home run where like Andy Wallace is already set up to mix. It's all done. And pretty much I have a demo CD and it's pretty much the album. They just recorded a few different things. But my thing was, you know what? These guys are really cool. I love their songs, and I just like hanging out with them. And so I was like, oh, I'll do the OPM record instead of the Linkin Park record. Now, some people would be like, that was a weird choice. But <laughs> That was a horrible choice in recollection. <laughs> but um, probably about $6 million less in my bank account. But that's okay, <laughs> because I have to say, way more fun. And <laughs> arguably, we wouldn't be sitting here at this, you know, at this juncture in life, which is making me really, really happy. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. It's but, so funny because I read the article and I was like, I didn't even think, like, what was the band? What was the reason? But it just said that you chose to stay in L.A. Yeah. No, and and we, it uh, was, this record was like, okay, well, I am doing this and I'm committing to this, which meant I didn't get back to New York for a long time. Yeah. yeah. What? No regrets. So you kind of transitioned over from hip-hop into rock let's say well this Broadly. was the the great time and lucky for me i just at that time i'd mixed black robo motorcycle club and then beck and everyone in rock was looking at new york and the hip-hop scene sonically mm. i mean that was the argument of lincoln park they were like we love what you're doing sonically we have the songs and you know um we just want sonically that vibe so for me it was a very good time to be transitioning from new york to la and you know what? It's the, what's the? Uh, there's a great song by Rob Junkless, this Memphis guy. When I was like 15, I heard, and it's basically like, New York gives you attitude, LA gives you gold, and Memphis gives you soul. And I'm like, well, I gotta have, I gotta have some of the LA Love gold that. at some point. And yeah. I was like, ah, oh. and you get it. And really, the gold is actually the beautiful weather and all of the, the things that we love about living here, which is, arguably, the best place in the world to live, yep. and right now, the best time in the world to live here. Interesting. Yep. So yeah. So then so did we you started up, that record. You end up mixing the entire album then. He mixed that the whole cool. record, but he also produced. Okay. He ended up. So That's we we had the we had the handful of songs that we did in New York with Josh and and the team. And That's then, Golden State of Mind, right? No, this is Menace of Sobriety. Oh, that was Menace. It's our first record. Okay. And then uh, and then we did the rest of a the classic. record. classic. With Michael. Yeah, it is a classic. It's a classic. It is a classic. It's a very rare like we. We tried to make, we were trying to make a record that was like a mixtape almost of like what, you know, if you just threw like shuffle play on at a barbecue. So we were trying to incorporate, you know, hip hop and reggae and punk rock and. You're testing a whole bunch of different yeah. stuff. I mean, when you think about all the people who were on that record, yeah. who participated, it's like, I know that people think of Sublime and that record. To me, I mean, it's a, it's a classic California record. And there, there are right. a few classic California records, but I think one of the most, and I do believe it's time will come where people recognize it as the classic it is, right. is Minister of Sobriety. It's, it, it really, it, it encapsulates the time, it encapsulates the history of all the people involved, and especially looking at what was going on in the world at that time, I, 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 like, I, I think it's a classic. Yeah. I'm biased, but I think, you know, I hear people hit me up, they're like, oh, that record, that's a great record, and that was really important to me. Well, it's you interesting, know? though, I, I mean, just from my perspective, like, it wasn't a a record that I knew. Yeah. Right? And then now... Now you're like, true I, I went back to it, <laughs> and I, I've listened to it, and I'm like, fucking great record. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It really is. It's like, yeah. wow. And part of that you know? is the, I say, the innocence of the people making the record. You know, that's me. That is everyone involved. It was just like, this is cool. What is, what, what is the best... Um, of everyone at that moment and bringing in right. the guests like it like just a great moment yeah in time. like you mentioned Chucha we had we brought in Ozo Motley and uh, 
Jack from Psycho Realm. Um, Fishbone. Fishbone, Angelo. Eric Avery, James Addiction, which I was in the restroom. And I walk in, I go straight to the restroom, and I hear James Addiction playing. And for me, you know, one of the revelations I had in my life at that moment is when we were, I forget which studio it was, it was in Burbank. And we had we brought um, Eric in because Eric in, yeah. we wanted him to play, replay the bass. But he's like, now I want to play guitar. And Wait one a of second. The, I, didn't, I didn't even know that. But I, I know the bass line coming down the mountain, yeah. right? Yeah. The is guitar that? on that is Eric Avery, who yeah. plays the bass, bass in James. He play, already had played it on the sample. It was a sample. Yeah. And we brought him in to replay it. And right. he's like, no, the sample rocks. Let's leave it. Let me play this. Well, I got it, this guitar. It sped like, up so fast. I, yeah. I tried to play it myself, and I was like, I can't even play that. that What's fast. cool about that is <laughs> watching <laughs> Eric play, you're like, oh, I get that Dave Navarro is the rock guy, right. but the heart and soul of James Addiction is actually Eric Avery. Absolutely. When you're hearing him the play, bass you're lines, like, the James bass yeah. lines during but the you Eric realize era. the guitar stuff. Yeah, he exactly. was playing. He wrote yeah. a lot of the guitar stuff. Makes yeah. sense. And you're like, oh, that's a that's an interesting little uh, yeah. little tidbit. And a great guy. I ended up mixing many years later a record for him that's so cool. Hmm. And it's just like. Oh, that's no one has heard that record, and it's great. You know, that's, that's interesting to say because, like, let's I've take big, a break real quick. Yeah. Now. All right. Which one? Which one? I'm standing by my energetic thought. I love this because this one is smoother. This one is great, but there's something about there's a little overtone on this one. I, I'm not proficient in my beer vocabulary, but I'm gonna guess this one. You would be correct. Yeah. I, yeah, nice. and I'm gonna say we go back to energy. You felt, you felt it. Yeah. And honestly, I was gonna, when probably the reason why he tried to stop me from saying it. But what my what my answer when you were kind of asking like what what would kind of define our style, mm-hmm. along with energy, is clean and crisp and drinkable. Like those are all sort of words that we mm-hmm. use for ours. So like, that's actually that would be my interpretation of that. Yeah. There's something about this that's the uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, it's great. It's like you're cruising in your car. You come to a speed bump, which is necessary, but that little speed bump is that little aftertaste overtone yeah. where this is just like... Well, I think you pulled it out from the energy, but yeah, you had one, from the maybe I, this, is, this is... John usually like leads it a little bit, but maybe I shouldn't say this, but how, how you explain that, John likes to create hits with the beer. That's right. Clean and crisp. Yep. Right? That's what... Some, and drinkable. And drinkable. Yeah. You know, That's what one of want. my questions that I forgot to ask before we started. I know John as John E. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and right. I was like, what do you prefer to be called these days? And I, I, I like I feel I can't not call him Johnny. No, you're but good. everything in his life has been geared toward, and this sounds really weird to say, a hit, right? He just sees culture in a very interesting way and is able to pull in, like, you know, we were talking about when he was showing me what was going in the brewery, like his the influence of the design of being in Europe, which of course is a direct result of OPM. Right. And it's interesting looking at the the paths we get to get to this place, but his awareness of what's going on in culture is what makes him great. And it's always been that way. Even back then it was the you don't know really know what you're doing in the studio, but it doesn't matter. Nothing's gonna stop you. Whoops. <laughs> He's a curator. Does yeah. that happen? Has that happened yet? That no, was, you win. You won the award. We we had that uh, pre-planned. We said whoever spills first wins. Perfect. Well, at least there's still some in here. Okay. Uh, I'm probably gonna, uh, probably gonna get we'll get we'll get a few more. Wow. No worries. You get a little beer in me, and this is what happens. <laughs> but yeah, th- there's been n- no doubt from the beginning that there is something about Johnny that always saw that and saw right. the hit. That's why you you were able to remember the the German word I was looking for. You are part of it. This, you, this, were, you were you were up my mess. The zeitgeist. The zeitgeist. Yeah. yeah. He's always been part right. of the zeitgeist. There's something to that, you know, there or is. been able to see what that is, you know. Even if he's not part of I, it at the time, he saw that. There's still a taste in there for you. That's there is. Yeah. Okay. There is, and I'm not gonna knock it over. Okay. No, <laughs> the zeitgeist. I, I've I recognize with that with John immediately. Like John has zeitgeist. And I was like, it's unique. And this is the thing. You gotta, you, that's your superpower, by the way. It is. There I are certain know. people you bet like, on because of that. I don't know what that. that is, but I... Okay. It's funny, like, I'm, you know, when I was little, I started, you know, I was drawing, and then you hear people say, like, oh, wow, this is amazing as an artist. And then I was like, people always be like, how do you do that? And I'm like, oh, I, I just practice. 
you know? Like, I just, I honestly believe that, like, I was just able to do it because I, I focused on it and yeah. practiced. Um, and I believe that my whole career, and then I remember one time we were in Europe, and I was doing an interview with a European person. And he was like, you know, what do you, what do you want to say to, like, kids out there who were, like, I think it was a German guy. He's like, what do you want to say to, like, kids out there who, like, look up to you and they think that they're going to be able to do what you're doing? And I was like, well, yeah, they can. They just, they just got to do it. They just got to do it, you know? And he's like, no. And he was, uh, <laughs> and he was, um, he was like getting pissed at me. Like, <laughs> like. He didn't no. like that answer. He didn't like it. He's like, no, not anybody can do what you're doing. And I was like, well, yeah, they can. You just got to, you know, just got to set your mind to it. Da, 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 da. And then after that happened, like we almost got into a fight <laughs> in an interview and it was bizarre. And then I was like, it really made me think, I was like, man, is there, is there something different? You know, like, is there something different? I don't know. Is there something, I mean, for me, obviously, I don't know, but. So my, my, my guess on this. Here comes Chef. Here comes Hello. Chef. Let's eat some food. Hi, Chef. Hello. You got to do the uh, call in the chef. Call in the chef. <laughs> oh, wow. What do we got, Chef? We have a spicy chicken ranch. Spicy chicken ranch sandwich. With uh, Underwood uh, Ranch. With Underwood Ranch. And Spidey Bites. Spidey Bites? Yes. These are both brand new items. Um, this normally doesn't look like this. He just cut it in four so we could all just take a bite. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the Spidey Bites is something new that we're trying. Is that like a cheese bread type? It's just like garlic and olive oil. and Same uh, same crust as the... Same as the pizza crust? Pizza crust? Okay. Yeah. So, awesome. And some oregano. And some oregano. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Very you, nice. chefs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, so whenever you're ready, just, you know, grab a bite of one of those. Yeah. I think body bites first. I think one of the things, John, I think you have a really good ability to do is to concentrate. Concentrate? No, like you're not a, you're not a multitasker. Yeah. Like when you're like when you're thinking about something, you seem like dead on. I'm I'm only thinking about this. And then you're like, "All right, now I'm going to move on to the next thing." Yeah. Well, I think that's part of the the beauty of him and I think that's the, the X factor that most people can't do and it's like it's easy but it is when you focus when you have a singular vision on what you're doing uh, then you find that, that that happens and most people can't have that focus and that vision right. if they did they would make it happen I think people that can focus really well can go really deep into something Yeah. but if people that are like jumping around their brains going all over the place like they're just like yeah. it's like going through a forest if you're like I'm chopping over here now I'm going to chop over here. Uh -huh. Like, when I see you, like, concentrate, you're just, like... Lock in. Lock in, and yeah. you just, like, cut through that forest deep. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think I think that's part of the reason that you're able to do a lot of things really well. Well, that was the realization for me during COVID time, right before actually, you know, probably at the beginning, end of the OPM record and moving on to other things. Uh, you know, my girlfriend, then wife at the time, was like, I think you have ADHD. You should really have that checked out. And I was like, whatever. And I didn't, right? Mm. And then I did, and it was just bananas for a month because I was over-medicated. And I'm like, I'm not going to go near that again. And at the beginning of COVID, I was medicated properly, and I actually understood the idea of the neurodivergent mind and the ability that, the understanding that certain people can focus and certain people can't. Where it's like, you know what? I see a little flash over there. I'm like, oh, that's a bright, shiny thing. I have to go over there. Right. And I appreciate even more now that I understand with a bit of medication and a bit of systems in my life that I can create that focus that I never had. It's probably why the OPM record took so long to make because of <laughs> my ADHD, which I didn't know at the time. But it's the realization, you know, true what the interviewer said. Not everyone has that kind of thing, but it's actually, not everyone can do it, but you realize that when you have focus and that singular focus you can make anything happen there's a, a great your focus goes energy flows absolutely there's a great saying oh. by this uh writer of magic called gary lockman i think it was in the jason Lou podcast where he talks about the visions we have for ourselves when we are younger come to us in waves in the future right we put the vision out and we do it and the only reason why these things don't happen anymore is because we stop having that vision those visions for what our life can be right you know and i think johnny has been a, a great example of like 
here's the vision, here's the focus of what I want, and it gets them to whatever that next place is, and then there's another vision, and then that. And then, you know, we're sitting in the middle of one of them. So we it's a re the real the creating reality from, from the mind. Yeah, 100%. Um, we are sitting in the middle of one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that we, weird? We talked about this. Yeah, we like, have. When did we so talk about doing yeah. this? And we're now yeah. we're in the middle of doing it, right? Yes. Yeah, and also that this this thing very similar is like, you know, another thing that was you know going on with like the music stuff. Uh, being a band is a team sport, and that's a thing that like a lot of people have a hard time getting grip around. Obviously, this place like I, I appreciate you guys all the praise, but you know this is like this is a team effort here. Um, I think that like similar to like you know the experience for me like OPM was like I think and like to what you're saying like probably didn't I probably didn't attribute it to the focus I always kind of thought like I was just like you know the heartbeat of the band where like I was the one who was just driving like there's so many times when when you're sitting there and you're just getting beaten up you know by so many things and then it's like you know like people take pause like oh, what, why the fuck am I doing this you know they always want to stop and I'm <laughs> right. like nope let's go we're going and I'm so sort of like you know, like I guess you know, like you're saying, the word would be focused. I'm just so focused on getting to where I feel like we should be going, that like, like none of that's gonna stop me. You know, right? And um, it's interesting. I I know Jeff basically from uh, we do jujitsu together, and um, and uh, we choke each other. Yeah, we we beat each other up. <laughs> where do where do y'all do jujitsu? Jiu At Morambi. He's actually wearing the, the hat right now. Morambi Jujitsu. That's a good hat. Which is just basically right down the street from here. We have an amazing academy. Uh, Professor Fabio Leopoldo, um, multi-time world champion. Yeah, oh. and yeah. still like That's who still, you want to learn from, right? Exactly. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's he's one of the best in the world. And um, so yeah, so um, and that that you know in my life is a huge part of you know you know that focus whatever. Like that's like sort of my you know when I go there, that's my my sort of my Zen place. You know when you're when you're someone's about to choke you out you have no choice but to turn off every other part of your brain except for the brain the, the part that's helping you survive at that moment right and that um and like keep you know keying into that part of my brain in the rest of my day like trying to make things happen is always something that's um that's been there for me um i mean think of this you have focus that he has and if i go back if I start now and I think about who's the jujitsu person you just mentioned, world champion, Professor Fabio Leopoldo. Okay, so if we work backwards to the beginning Sorry, from what from the discussion. If you look at you know him working for Moyer Marie for Steve Moyer, who is a legend in his own right. Right. If you look at um, during the OPM record, the mentor of that record from the label was Michael Beinhorn, who produced Soundgarden and just tons of classic records. The you know focus combined with someone who is guiding that focus in, in you know in an energetic way right you know, I was gonna go is that. that kind of thing whether or not go back to zeitgeist right it's finding you happen to have the drive people see the drive and can acknowledge that and then that is shaped like a diamond you know mm -hmm. and it's shaped into what you want and then that leads to the next adventure the next adventure the next adventure and here we are you know and there's, there's a very important nugget in there that I, I don't want to let go mm -hmm. in that um, something that I feel like I can attribute to, you know, my life is that like it takes a certain person to be able, especially as a man, it's maybe a woman thing as well, but I don't know. I'm not a woman. Mm -hmm. But as a man, I know that it's, it's hard for men to allow a mentor. Yeah. You know, like to not to not have like so much ego that they get to the point like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm I know everything now. You know, like to, to continue to like like we talked about it uh, in one of the earlier podcasts about like I was talking about like the the George St. Pierre mentality, stay a white belt kind of a thing, right? Like mm. even though James George St. Pierre is one of the baddest men on the planet, if he goes in to train with a new coach or mentor, he comes in with a, with a white belt on, like showing respect, like I'm I'm here to learn from you. Right. Um, going into an academy like that where you have all these professors who are, you know, you're, you know, you have to just be humble and, and I'm here to learn today. 
Um, as much as I might think I know about jiu-jitsu, I can always learn more. And then, you know, like you said, like like uh, having people in my life, like you said, like Lisa Marie and, and Steve Moyer, like going into those, like getting that level of mentorship at that point in my right. life was, was super insane. And then to go, like you said, like, you know, having meeting people like Beinhorn, um, and then, you know, you working with you at that point, like you, like the time that we spent with you, like the, like there was like, I learned, I knew nothing. It's like a transfer of energy. Yeah. I knew nothing about how to make a record. And we went into that studio and I left that experience and I went on to be able to produce a record. There was something Eric Avery said to me from James when we were we were having lunch at some point in LA and he's like, you know, when I was like 12, my dad got me boxing lessons. And it wasn't so much about boxing, it was the fact that once I got hit, I realized I could take a hit. Yeah. And once you realize you can take a hit and you can go on, then your life changes a little bit. Yep. You know, and mm -hmm. the thing that I was gonna ask you is, and we can go back to the mentors that were important, but not everything is good, not everything is golden, right? Who were the mentors around when things were really tough for you and who influenced you in that way and got you out of whatever hole you were in? That's a great question. Wow. I love that. Michael just upped my question. He just yeah. added a little plus to it. <laughs> it was awesome. This Man. is the Michael, Michael Patterson show. <laughs> it's the Michael yeah. Patterson show. Oh, that is tough. Um, I think there's M-N-O in Michael Patterson. Yeah? Yes. Is there M-N-O? Let's see. I just have the M and N in my name. You have? I don't have the O. No, you don't have the M. I, I, I got the M. I got your M. All right. Can you get my O? I got your O. There you go. <laughs> Teamwork. There, there go. you go. <laughs> That's a tough question. I'm trying to think of like, I'm trying to think of that one. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm stumped on that one. Like, when things are tough though, like when, let's just go, let's, let's just dig into like a time things were tough yeah maybe I, moving I, from atlantic uh yeah leaving that that was tough yeah the end of atlantic was tough um, uh, who gave you that who gave you that soft yeah, landing uh zinger zinger was there for me then. yeah actually yeah. <laughs> when well, i feel there may be issues at some point with zinger yeah but you know, it is the whether or not you have a great experience with someone through the entire part of the relationship. Like you meet a woman, you meet a man, and you yeah. fall in love and everything else, and then you get divorced. Something happens, but right. there's that moment there, that there where the connection, the universe brings you together. And actually, you know, yeah. it, looking at Zeitgeist, there was no better time in history to, excuse me, to be at that label than when you got involved in that, right? Yeah. It was the label that was dealing, you know, we talk, I think we, my first introduction to them was when we were making the OPM record, yeah. and there wasn't even a thought. It was like, oh, there's this cool thing they're doing. And when you look at, here's Atlantic doing this with these big systems, and here's a guy who doesn't have that big system yeah. doing it on his own, like, I think also there's a hustler aspect that Johnny probably saw in him. Yeah. And you know what, it is, it, this is exactly, you know, I, I, I look from the outside, but you know, there's a lot of things in Zinger that I see in you. Yeah. But it's all the, you know, it's the. You take the good things and move them into into build them into you, and the bad things, you know, you, you push aside, and you know the key is yeah. to know what's good and what's bad. Right. Yeah, and even even like. It's strange looking back now. It that was that was tough, but. Um, uh, because it was a lot of things happened to make that happen, mm -hmm. you know. Like so, there was a lot of lot of stuff happening there. But um, but you know, obviously in my life, much you know, much worse things have happened. Uh, you know, like I've been through much. You know, like in the big picture, like you know, whatever. I I I you know, I had an amazing experience at that point. You know, yeah. and like and the and the experience I had you know during the suburban noise years was you know, it was also amazing. Um, and um, and I had just as much fun in a sense, you know. Obviously, with Atlantic, there was just a lot more money around, which yeah. was cool. But um, yeah, and and then at, at that point too, like like I said, like I I had I had learned so much from that, like that that 
like you you you'd mentioned earlier like basically like you know the phd with puffy or whatever like like when, at the time we met you yeah you were like you know you were becoming a doctor of this business like right. you know like you were and I, I remember learning lessons from you that you were learning from him as well like his work ethic and uh, you know that dude's an amazing person obviously yeah. he's insanely successful and like yeah. you were absorbing all that stuff and, and yeah. through osmosis we were like kind of sucking it up through you too and I saw you I saw him in you the, yeah. the the hustler aspect of puffy is what I saw in Johnny but that's what attracted me because you know you have the debate of there are two bands you're working with or the potential mm-hmm. and then we'll take the Lincoln Park thing out of it let's say there's a and B you know part of that is which one can go the distance which one has the hustle to get past that and you know very to get past all of the problems and very there's always gonna be problems yeah, yeah. and very clearly what yeah. I my experience was I see this person puffy and what they do I see that in Johnny and know that whatever happens whatever hill comes up he's gonna climb that hill yeah right no and I think that I mean that 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 part of me that translates into my current role in life at this you know here with the brew whatever is that yeah that's I'm just troubleshooting you know that's what it always is just troubleshooting problems um, it's off, like the, the idea like a lot of people and that you know now having a hundred over 100 employees like people come with problems all the time but like that that saying of like if you're not if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. We get it all the time. People come with a problem, come, problem, come, problem. It's like, bring me a fucking solution, you know? Right. Show up with the problem and the solution. Yeah, give me both, Yeah. Right. you know? And then, then you're going to be right here, you know? Like, you're going to be with me. But, like, those people... That, that specific lesson from one of my mentors back in 2000, I remember going into the office of a CEO. Um, I kind of played the same role as your wife at the time. I was the chief of staff and I came into the CEO and I said here's the problem and this is what I think we should do about it. And he just looked at me and installed and I was like, oh shit I shouldn't have said, shouldn't have brought that up. He looks pissed. He goes, finally someone came in here. You were like, honest? But you also came with a solution. And I was like, and I was like, okay, I always do that. The rest yeah. of my life. That was like a big impact point. He is like, not only did you bring clarity to the problem but you like actually brought some way to solve yeah. this for yeah. me because i'm sure everybody just came there every single day and just brought them more and more problems yeah. and i noticed you walking around here i'm always surprised at how like calm you are and how like for me that'd be challenging to have to like keep on hearing like oh you no, should do this no, i want to kill people how, how about you day, do, how about me. you do this <laughs> Well, maybe maybe you should do this or this is going on. Why is this going? On? Like I, I would just I, I yeah. I'm well, not wired the great to thing do about that. I, something I uh, read Jeff Bezos say or saw him say is that I where I am in the company I should only be making three decisions a day, the highest quality decisions for our company, right? Because mm-hmm. you realize when you look at the structure of something, it's this you know how you have people report to you and let them figure things out so that you can make the best decisions, the most minimal decisions that have the most effect mm. on where a business is going or something is going. And, you know, that's, it, it takes a lot to figure that out because you want to be the person that everyone comes to with their problems and you want to be the solution right. person. But the key is you find, hire the people who, who can find the solutions right. and free up your brain to work at a higher level and think of the big, the big picture, you know? Right. That's interesting. Because that's a, you know, that's a lot of 100 people. That's a lot of people to have to deal with, to interact with. And every one of those has things going on in their life that is affecting what they're doing. And it's affecting, you know, the business. You now, know? now, it might just be the pairing of the food that we had, but you obviously have a favorite between the, the, these, these well, two I last Well, I spilled beers. most of this one. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> this so, the table. Right. That really, could be a, something totally so, different. So then. if you had to guess on this one. This is a tough one. Yeah. Because. Do the energy thing first. You don't have anything I, I tried to, and then I was like, I spilled it. That was part of the. You know what? Oh, that's. Oh, hold on. <laughs> oh, hold on. Okay, oh, so man. now we have to analyze did this one spill mm-hmm. because it was the right one or was it not? It, um, but it, my feeling is, taste wise, they're both great. Like, they're right. both with. There was a very clear winner on the first one, and that was flavor and flow. But if I had to say, you know what? 
I'm going to say the energy of this one made me spill this one. And even though they're super close, I'm going to say I'm going to say B. B is correct. Wow. You get Josh's car. Yeah. I love B that. B is correct. <laughs> so, so an interesting thing about this particular beer is that What's this one called? <clears throat> This is this is just an R and D beer. Okay. So if you notice, this this brew house over here is a twenty barrel, okay. and this one over here is a five barrel. Okay. So that's like our R and D brew house. Okay. And um, so this actually is called the R and D Brown Research and Development okay. Brown. So um, our distributor, which is Stone, which is a, a a large, you know, like it's like it's like getting a record deal. They're like they're like the biggest independent label. Right. Like they were, you know. Um, and uh, they just recently lost uh, a brewery in their book that makes a brown. So they came to us, which we're very excited about, and they right. said, "Hey, if you guys want to make a brown, you know, we can. It would be really good in our book. There's, it would fill a void." So this is the first uh, version. Dante just made it. It's called the R and D Brown. It was just our first run at it. Um, it's really good. It's really good. It, it will get better because um, he'll keep working on it. Well, um, let me ask you this. Yeah. The one that was here, the C, that's an existing brand, right? Yes. Who's the brand? This is June Lake Brewing Company. Okay. They're in June Lake, which is up near yeah. Mammoth. Yeah. Yep. And uh, they're good friends of ours. Um, My theory is why you spilled that one is June Lake wants to stay here. Yeah. Wanted so, to stay. So it's funny because <laughs> Mike, our brewer, our our brewmaster, Mike and Dante are our brewers, mm -hmm. but uh, Mike's family has had a house in Mammoth for you know, you know, a couple decades, I would imagine, and so they spent a lot of time there. So they're they're very friendly with the June Lake guys, and actually, at the moment, one of their brewers, uh, their their head brewer, is leaving to go to brew with another company in Colorado. So the 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 uh, the second brewer is now taking over. So he's here training with Dante at the moment. Um, so he's actually one of our brewers at the moment. So when that's a funny story about that. But yeah, so they do want to stay. And he's like, I love this place. <laughs> <laughs> June Lake might be screwed right now because he might want to stay here with us. When you were an OPM, signed yeah. to Atlantic, and yes, you're sir. like, I want to have a number one hit. Yeah. Right? Because that's the goal, you know? Yes. What is the number one hit for what you're doing, for, for, for brewing for Tarantula Hill? What does that look like? So it's funny that you say that because I, I look at each beer – as like a record, like I, I, I look at this as like I'm trying to run a record label. The brewers are the are the band, mm -hmm. and every beer that comes out, we're looking at it as like it's a record. I've I've said this a bunch of times, and we're trying to make those hits. Currently, that beer right there, Liquid Candy, yep. that's our that's our our big hit right now. That's heaven is a half. Pipe. That's heaven is a half pipe. That that beer right now is about 50 percent of our distribution. So it's and that's what do people say? Why? Why do you think that is? Is it the packaging? Because obviously, if I look at this, I'm like, that's really cool. I'm I want to try that. that. Yeah, exactly. The packaging is a big part of it. Um, it. It's the whole. It's the whole thing, right? It's it's like it's the same with with music industry, right? Like you got to have, you got to have. It's got to be the whole package, right? You can't just, you know, like you could have the best song in the world, but if if it's not packaged correctly, no one even knows about it. Right? So it's a hazy, right? It is a hazy. That one is, it, which is, a it's it's a little more rare than like, you know, than the West Coast. So it, there is pretty much all the you know restaurants, whatever that have a, have an extensive tap list. They want to have a hazy on tap, right? And so, and this one is is definitely a superior hazy. Um, but our other ones do as well too. Like the uh, our blonde is doing really really well out there, and then we have two West Coast IPAs, Trancho Hill IPA, and Cali Day IPA. <coughs> the brown is going to be basically in, in, entering into our core line of beers as well. Into the album. Now, what's interesting yeah. to me about this and looking at this is knowing Johnny forever, and then hearing him talk about the influence of being in Europe and touring on design and things like that. You know, one of the things that impressed me when I first went into M and O was like, who did these paintings? And he's like, oh, they're mine, right? So then, when you realize there's not just a musical vision, there's this ability to paint and create art. One of the really impressive things about all of the Tarantula Hill, Hill stuff is the artwork. Or like, I'm looking at these uh, cans that are directly in front of me. Like, 
who does the cans, who, who are the artists, how, what's the process for, for creating the art of, of all this, because it's great. So basically, I'm like I'm like the art director. He's a curator. I'm the creative curator, director right? of yeah. this I'm place. I'm the creative director, yeah, right? Own it. Um, I'm the you know I'm the I'm one of my titles here is CMO. I'm the chief marketing officer. Um, and then Josh over here <laughs> is um, this pale can he did he he does really he does a majority and then and then so like say that batch O2 dry hop one mm -hmm. that one is uh, Murdoch. So you know we'll we'll kind of farm out. Right. To different people. We have, uh, the, our core line is done by Risk, who is a world famous graffiti artist who happens to live here in Thousand Oaks. Um, you remember Third Rail? Yeah. He, that was his company. Really? Um, and then he, he's, he's done all kinds of stuff. That one is not your friend. <laughs> no. It, no. Wants, it wants to stay here. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, June Lake. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, he um, you know, we basically, you know, used his art. Uh, to do our core line, um, which is amazing, um, and he's been super supportive of us and the brand. And and um, think whatever. about how crazy it is. Like when I think about when you go in the cannabis shop, right? Yeah. Look at some of the packaging. The packaging is unbelievable, right? And when you hear the stories of who created them, I mean, think about just a graffiti artist. Yeah. I mean, when we look back in time, and it's like that person who's just doing graffiti is now a well-known right. graphic artist. Like. We're in a renaissance time of art yeah, right. and packaging, yeah. and that's being driven by brands like this and yeah. by cannabis industry. And there's this, obviously, there's the, there's this thing that both of those are consumable. Yeah. Um, I want to say countercultural things, even though they're not anymore. Well, I think, and I think it's 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 an amazing sorry. time. It's interesting. Great, that great art on this, by the way. It's, I, Thank and you. I haven't looked at it in detail. It just stands out. I think it's interesting. Like you're kind of. I think the first time we heard about this, they, someone wrote the book, uh, The World's Flat, right? We all have mm -hmm. information to everything that we want now. Yeah. And now I think it's like comes down to people that are like collaborators and curators. Yeah. Like, who are you going to trust to pull something together for you? And I think that's the new world. Well, this is yeah. the interesting thing about looking at record labels. There was a time period, and this is like we talk about Kevin Zinger, right? Um, there was a period, you know, a record label was... They had the money. You had to go through a record label, and you know now a record label is just a bank. You know Zinger right. in whatever way was like, I can find these artists, put them out on the cheap, and work with distributors to put things out. But I don't need the big record label money because I am finding the fans through a different way. And you know when you look at what's going on, whether it's crypto or cannabis, there's this golden age of not needing the same kind of resources as you used to need to put things out. Obviously, right. an operation like this, you do, but, you know, you learn how, you know, culture works within cons the consumer world. Yeah, right. Consumption. Right. And, like, I don't know. It's just, like, I'm looking over here at the cans, and it just makes so much sense as to why I would be attracted to that without even knowing what it is. I would immediately right. grab that. We get that? We get taste some of this? Yeah, let's try. I'd love, kind of staying on that same thought, I'd love to... Oh, look at that. Now I see the back. That's good. So That's it's basically the inspired by Pale Rider, yeah. the Clint Eastwood movie. And then uh, we didn't want to use Clint Eastwood, so basically he, Josh flew in. Uh, if you see a resemblance there, he, he flew in like parts of my face on there. So That's great. It's kind of me. What is... But. So what is the material that's put on the can? They're stickers, basically. Yeah, I'll show you the can line before you go. Like, basically, the you know the can comes down without a lid on it, goes through, gets filled that's with good. beer. Um, a young lady came in here, and y'all were discussing how old you were, but the reference was actually not how old you were, but what year you graduated, high school, I assume. Right. He's back so in his hometown. When you're in a place <laughs> yeah. like that, like I assume that a lot of that happens because you you know you know, yeah. and that's that's part of the beauty of it. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And that's part of the beauty of coming back and having success and then coming back and doing something like this. Yeah. A, it's exactly what the community needed. Yeah. And it's, you know, it ties upon everything that you've learned up till now. One thing you said that was interesting is I personally, the best time in history for me was COVID. I know a lot of people had some really bad times and I feel bad for those, right? But for me, it was like, I'm sitting here by myself and I'm figuring some shit out, right? Yeah. What did you figure out? Um... A, that I had ADHD. B, that 
I could have told you, by the way, a long time ago that you had ADHD. <laughs> Thanks, you should have jumped out. Sorry, I just I assumed you knew. The <laughs> routines, like obviously, you know, we were talking about magic and energy earlier, but when you're sitting there by yourself and you're like, I can't go anywhere, I'm stuck in, you know, obviously, beautiful place where I live in the hills, and it was just, it was a wonderful experience. You know, you have a lot of time to think, a lot of time to journal, a lot of time to work on yourself. And, you know, to go back to what I was saying, the, you know, what you were saying was a lot of this stuff, the cans and such came out of the COVID time yeah. because you had to adjust the business. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, looking at that, I see people saw COVID as not an opportunity, but just life pushed you in a certain way where you had to adapt. There's a, you know, the best burger in LA is a place called For the Win. It's right down the hill for me. That was a fancy little French um a French place and they were like okay we have to adapt and they ended up making the best burgers around and then now they have like five or six of them wow. and it's interesting looking at being able to adapt yeah. like y'all did and here I am holding not only a can of great beer but also you know supporting artists um, supporting a whole distribution world because obviously as these are in stores people are buying them right. people are getting great joy maybe they're seeing seeing things in life they haven't seen because they're having a little bit of experience it's interesting i and it trickles down yeah. in, in right when COVID started uh there's a coach that i used for years off and on uh no i he had like a life coach a, a, no it's like an industry coach but he had a seminar it was like a free seminar go to this and i was like i don't know i'm just gonna sign up and he said something that like really impacted me he's like um basically said 80% of people, or it was like, maybe it was like 30% of people are going to have a bad year because of COVID. The, the midsection is going to do kind of okay. And there's going to be these people that are just going to maximize yeah. COVID in a, a really good way. Like yeah. try to find a way that you can like do better. And you make know, have an edge in some ways. And have an edge yeah. in some ways. I did that with my business. Yeah. Like for sure, I created a product I would have never created because I had time to do it. Yeah. And it actually worked and I didn't. And had no idea if it would work or not. But you'd have looking, success before, right? Yes. In life. Yeah. And But looking back, I would have, like, now I'm like, man, why did I even do that? I didn't know anyone was going to, like, buy yeah, this. Yeah. And people bought it. And now we're revamping it. But I'm like, that really, like, stood out to me. And I and one and another thing that resonated with me when you said, man, we had all this beer. We didn't know what we, wow, what are we going to do with it? We have to can yeah, it. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned you and Ollie. I think we're sitting up front. We're and you sitting had right there looking at all these full tanks. Close the doors <laughs> and you're looking at all these full tanks. Like, yeah. what are we going to do? But you guys found a way yeah. to pivot and make the best out of the situation in a positive way. I think it's... Yeah. Well, think about this. When I, think, when I speak of Johnny, right? Being in the studio with Johnny, you're sitting there and he's like... You know, and I can relate... Um, Johnny and Biggie in the same thing. So I'm throwing you in Biggie, right? Damn. Um... You guys might need to leave the room. My head just exploded. <laughs> the aspect, and this is the great thing about about artists, I'll right? Write Justin next week. Jeez. Is someone sitting there? We get this, Josh. Are we getting all this? Like, he said it twice. Okay. Someone so sitting there listening to a track, right? And vibing on a track, and then all of a sudden, you just come in with some great lyrics, right? Um, there's something in the brain that connects with like the idea of I have a problem. Which, which could be here's a great track after write lyrics so on, and then coming up with some great lyrics like there's a there's a brain thing that happens and I know like my girlfriend's a therapist works in the creative world would be like oh it's this but that thing of sitting there and saying I have a problem how do I create the solution in a creative way like I can completely see the two of you sitting there and coming up with that because that's just what I've experienced with you you yeah. know it's just being the the creative aspect of like oh and that's part of the hustler thing you know yeah it's the there's one aspect where there's the business side of it, which he gets from the Atlantic and from the Moyer Marie time period, but also the creative where it's like, oh, A, what COVID was for me was A and C. And then there were a few things I did in my life through meditation and some magic stuff in the gateway process, which is a whole other weird thing, <laughs> that added the B, right? And certain people are like, hmm, COVID time, beer that's a and c and then he's like oh b here's what that should be and right. clearly that i mean i'm sitting here looking at the manifestation of his will and i watch the auto what's his name the other guy ollie ollie, ollie yeah. looking at that you know Otto, but, i like that name Otto. Yeah. but change that's, it we have an otter <laughs> that's how Come creativity works as well yeah. right. because coming up with that solution is not a business solution it's a creative solution, yeah. right? And yeah. then also, you know, hey, this could be a boring beer like Miller Lite or something, but
but it's not. It's the how can I have artists like Josh create things that a become recognizable. You know, to me, part of any great um, look at Nine Inch Nails. When you look at Nine Inch Nails, you see the logo. That's great. You know, right. all of these are Nine Inch Nails logos. I mean, look at that. I definitely see. And please tell me, because I know when we did Cloak, when people started to get the tattoo of the logo on their arms, tell me someone's got the logo tattooed on them. Um, if not, it's got to happen. Someone I, will do yeah, it naturally. It's going to happen pretty oh. quick, actually. Because it's a great logo. Thank you. Yes, that was my, I did that logo. I, I mean, if you know, you know, if you've seen like the M&O logo, the OPM logo, yeah. it definitely, it's along that line. Um, and also, it also looks like a skateboard. It looks like a skateboard. It looks like oh Starship my Enterprise. Oh, God. Like, you have that, like, psh, my mind is blown. Yeah. It does. Doesn't yep. it? You know, it does. Yep. One of my favorite. Kevin is half pipe. Yeah. I was thinking about the how DNA. cool my life DNA is. is in there. In the DNA. And they actually allowed for me to have a cool part of my life. So I was thinking, I was, li I was sitting there, and there's a Moby album cover that I have a big print of. And I'm like, I'm on that cover. And then there's another piece of art I have where it's like, oh, that's actually me, even though no one knows that representation. I was like, songs have been written, like things like that. And I was like, oh, I've also shot the cover of a single. Because there was that time when we were at Soundcastle mixing the album. And I forget, Matthew maybe, or maybe it was you, was playing with the skateboard. And the skateboard went and smashed into a car window and broke the car window. His car. <laughs> His car. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was either you or him who then took the skateboard and smashed it into the window so it stuck out. And then yes. I took a photo on like one of my very first digital yes, cameras. Yes. I was like, and that became like the single cover. That and I was, was like, the single cover. I no was way. like, oh, yeah. I've, there's another check mark in my life that I've done is yeah. unintentionally doing the photography for a little cover of a single. But it's funny because that's a, that's a, what was that? What was the single? Was it Stash Up? No, that was Heaven is Half Pipe. Was it the Heaven is Half yeah. Pipe? And when I think about that, because I think about what's the, uh, it's the kid who's doing ollies off like the, the Bentley in Beverly Hills. Yeah. Like for me, when I think about heaven as a half pipe and I see what was going on in the world and I see that y'all capturing the zeitgeist of what yeah. was going on and what was going on in a way that was already here in culture, but we saw quickly go to there. Um, just that visual image kind of in like mm. that smashing into yeah. it kind of encapsulated what OPM was to me about like music, a, about culture, about everything. Date that a stake was put in the ground. It was yeah. stamped, yeah. yeah. So my real quick before we move off of that, the Soundcastle, my my memories of Soundcastle. First of all, that's the room that we were in was the room uh, where Sly and the Family Stone mm -hmm. did a probably a couple records, but um, he spent a lot of time in the room we were in. That was one. Two was uh, Bone Thugs was mm. doing a record in the back studio mm -hmm. when we were doing yep. that. Um, and we were like playing, you know, on our breaks, we were like playing basketball with Bone Thugs, which was like so good. just, you know, life-changing for me. And then three was, I remember the, uh, the uh, Rage Against the Coke machine we did there. Yes. Which was uh, um, so good. Panda. Remember, mm -hmm. your, he was your assistant on that session, Mike Panda. Yeah. He was, he's the guy talking about the Coke machine, and then uh, we smashed the TV with like a baseball bat, and it sounded like it was smashed. Anyways, those were those memories. <laughs> I that was used, I used that session as a great example to all bands. Yeah. And there's a thing that happens on all records, and especially major label records, which is the, let's say you're mixing for three weeks, week two, the band's like, yeah, we gotta go in for a meeting at the at the label. And they come back, and they have this dazed look on their face. And they're like, we've got to start thinking about the music video. And keep in mind, for eight months they've been making the record. So no one's cared about their health. They've been eating and everything else. And they're like, oh, we're shooting a video in two weeks, and we're out of shape. Like, there's a whole thing, and you see this on every record, where they're like, oh, we didn't think about this. And now we've actually got to think about this. And it's so funny. It's, like, it's funny to see, because you're like, oh. Yeah, I guess we haven't cared about ourselves in a while, and we have beards and everything else, <laughs> and now we have to shoot a video in two weeks. Yeah, happens every time. That's interesting. Talk about like visualizing things in the future. What what would you see as the next OPM album? 
I've, I've, wow. I've, I have Another some thoughts. Another brain stumper. I have some thoughts on this because <laughs> I was like, I was telling John, like it has to be, it has to resonate with the same era of people that were. Yeah. So I had a couple ideas like everything loops like around. Like F the yeah. HOA, I'm not gonna pay. I thought was one of them. <laughs> um, they have, they have, a, they have a song called Family Friends. A family, what is it? Family and friends. Family yeah. and friends. I thought family friends and ex-wives would be maybe resonate yeah. with, with their group. Um, <laughs> Now, what do you think? There's a great quote by Bruce Springsteen. And what Bruce Springsteen says is, when I look in the audience, I should see myself. And when the audience looks on stage, they see themselves, right? Mm. There's a reason why Sting always sells like 2 million copies of every record, because unlike Blink-182, he's just basically like, I'm um, writing about Viagra, whatever's going on in his life, but his fans have grown. Right. He grow, he's grown with his fans. His yeah. fans have grown with him. So it's not that's, he's that's pandering how, to them. I'm picturing this. He's yeah. writing what's going on in his life I mean, and I how think he's John's feeling. written, I mean, you see it here. Yeah. Well, no. And I, I, there was, at some point in my life, I gathered this this bit of being an artist that I, I feel like is lost on a lot of people for some reason. But your job as an artist is to represent right now. Exactly. That's it. That's your job. Right now. What's happening right now? Don't, you know, you can't linger on the past. You can't predict the future. Like, because you you document what's happening right now. And then this is something that's, like, lost on. I mean, like, this is something that somebody wise would understand. Like, me, as a, as in, in my infinite wisdom now, as an old person, could have told myself then. But I, I did understand that then. Like, it was just about you you're just, like... Because you go now, like you go back now, and you listen to like a record from that era, or whatever, and like everything flashes, it floods back into you, you know. Right. And I remember one time, very specifically, I had this this case of CDs that I had in my car, and and I was I was trying to date this girl, and she lived in Palos Verdes, and I was you know trying to go you know link up with her or whatever, and I was sitting out there, and I just started going through my CDs, and like I put on like Prince, Purple Rain, and like every song had like this story just bah, 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 right, from right. before and then I put on like Guns N' Roses you know like and it was just like that that part of it to me was like you know like you're you know so now you go you look back and say this this is an actual documentation mm-hmm. through art yep. of this exact moment in time and then that was that was our job so and as a listener it's the same thing yeah like you said like it's the I know when I hear this song I know exactly what girl is making out to a strawberry beret? Yeah. The first time I heard it. Yep. You know, and I think that that's an important, it's a, it's a, it's a stamp on your life in, in yeah. whatever way. And I think yep. that's a, that's why we love music. Yeah, and it's, exactly. it, you know, it's harder yeah. with TV or with film. Right. But with music, it is, it's, it's there. Yeah, exactly. I, before, when we started, beginning in 2020, before COVID, I made a vow to myself that I would not listen to anything for one year that I'd ever heard before. Except oh, wow. for potentially playlists that I made for when girls came over, because I was like, I, I know I that will I work. Think you're cheating. Right. But I think that part you're cheating. And it became like a whole thing because COVID. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, what am I going to listen to? And it was actually really interesting because I created, like, I found so much great stuff. Yeah. In a, I'm not going to any of those like imprints of my life from the past. I'm not going to go back to. This is this is something I actually wanted. I think Josh was raising his hand for something. Carrie wanted. Carrie wanted to know if you guys needed anything else to eat, if you wanted to bring out some more food or anything. You know what I want more than anything else in the world? Food is great. Keith Moon. I really want to try the ice cream. Ooh. Let's eat some ice cream. Who wants to try the ice cream? Uh, uh, do you have I'll a preference? Uh, Johnny, you pick. You know it intimately. Um, I McRae think. Road. I don't know. If there's McCray Road. Um, I know there's, do you like Butterfinger? That's yeah. what I want. There's yeah. some Butterfinger. Um, you should try. Uh. Get a Cookie Monster. So John can eat. Cook, cookie Monster is our most popular flavor. Then yes. It's blue. I like popular. <laughs> yeah. Give me um, the hits. Yeah. Carrie, get, Carrie, get up in that mic. And then there's uh, Say hi, Carrie. Hi. <laughs> Even she has more low end. Yeah, she's got more That's low end. It, yeah. it, it shows that Josh mixed the low end of yeah. yeah. Check, check. It's the low end theory. Yeah. Cookie Monster, Butterfinger. Butterfinger. Uh, what was the other one we said? Oh, I don't think there's any Mc- Rock Road right now. Or McCray Road. Okay. Um, the vegan cookie dough is 
fantastic. Oh, it's a bomb. You have yes. to have yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Sounds awesome. I'm bringing it. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Um, All right. Hold on. I want to. Oh, were you going down a path? I, I have a question I really want. Were you I finishing? Want, okay. Hey, go ahead. You go. Okay. Finish we'll come path. back. We'll come yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to bring back the ADHD thing that we spoke of earlier. Um, I think, um, like, you're one of the most intelligent people I've ever known in my life. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go on a limb here and say that this man is a genius. Mm-hmm. I, I really believe that. Um, that I think was after he compared you to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. All these great people. No, no. no he, we he, texted he, about that earlier. We yeah. set up. We're like, we're going to do this. I'm going to do this. No, seriously, he's a genius. Thank you. Um, which I think is, so it's kind of like the chicken or the egg thing or whatever. Is it, is, do you have ADHD because you're a genius or are you a genius because you have ADHD? Mutually exclusive. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, is I, I've spent enough time with you in my life to understand, like I've seen how your brain is that thing that you're talking about. It's it's funny that it's we look at it now, like you said, like much later in life, so oh yeah, that's that's ADHD, but to me it's like you're that's that's a name for it, but your brain is moving at such a pace. There's there's thing there's so much stuff I've I've seen it happen, I've seen you you know, I've seen, I mean, even in this conversation, I think if you watch this, you know, like if we go, we're, we're going to go back and watch it, like how, how far, how fast his brain is moving and at the, and at the level that it's moving and the rate and all, you know, all that stuff. Like it's, it's interesting that that is a thing. And then it's, it's like, I don't know. I mean, well, this is the thing. So two things happen, which is getting diagnosed with ADHD where I was like, I was working my therapist just before COVID. And she's like, you know, we got to come back to the ADHD thing. And she told me to buy a book on ADHD. And I got it. And then I didn't read it for like two sessions. She's like, okay, we're done. I'm not working with you anymore. <laughs> and That's, I was like, okay. How many, how many people with it. ADHD can read a book on ADHD? <laughs> so yeah, right. when I read it, like the first 10 chapters are very, very short. But they're stories about people with ADHD. And you're like, yeah. oh, yes. Okay, that's me. Right. And then when you have a grasp on that you're like okay well let me figure out more about what this is so i got on medication but then i met a woman who i'm currently dating pam who is a therapist who deals with kink ethically non-monogamous adhd and she's an adhd coach who has adhd so seeing someone who has adhd have complete control of their life because not just the drugs but the systems they put in place and also more importantly made me realize that As good as I was before thinking and things like that, you know, being neurodivergent is a superpower, right? But it's how do you control that? How do you put systems in place so that, you know, there's a great, I forget who said it, it's not, it doesn't matter who said it, but your brain is for thinking, not remembering. Yeah. And it's also, there was a great TikTok, which TikTok is the greatest thing ever invented, by the way. For ADHD. Uh, for ADHD. For, <laughs> for, it's, it's unbelievable. Do you have a TikTok account, I think? I do, yeah. It's, it's great. Um, <laughs> there's a guy who says ADHD is not attention deficit disorder. It's intention deficit disorder. And the fact that people with ADHD can't see the future, which is also why, mm. you know what, if you told me you have to drink this beer in two weeks, five minutes before I had to give you my report on it i would guzzle the whole thing yeah right because i can't see time in the same way which actually makes it great yeah. so it's how do you harness the superpower aspects and i do think that you know there's a someone who there's a guy from sweden who was like you should talk to michael and we went and we had drinks and he's like so all these things you're telling me about the future of the business and all the stuff he's like that's great i've never heard that but why aren't you further along in pursuing that you know, yeah. why is there not the tarantula hill of my life in whatever way? And I don't think it was up until probably the last six months that I understood the, th- the systems I need to put in place and right. the team I need to put in place. Yeah. In order to see because that vision. There's, there's the aspect of I can think of it, yeah. but it's very hard for me to make, to manifest that. Yeah. So it's really finding the like-minded people who are not, you know, yeah. I'd say the Johnnies of the world who are like, I have the focus, but they also have the creative brain. And they're like, oh, I see that. And you can banter back and forth, yes. which makes it really difficult at times in life. To yeah, and I've always, I've always thought that about you, like that you, you've never had like the proper team around you, you know, to harness well, I mean, your, even you know. With the, the nightclub at Cloak and Dagger, yeah. where you're managing people. 
right? Yeah. And you look back after all that happened and you're like, well, okay, I see the things I missed out on because I didn't know how to manage people properly or to the people who were there like, let us help you to let them help. And at some point it's like, uh, you have to let go yeah. and trust. It's like the falling, you know, where you fall and your team catches you. Yeah. It's the realization of like, oh, there are good people who want to help, let them help. You yeah. can't do everything yourself. Yeah. There's and a, there's a for quote, me, I try to. A quote in an article I read that you did, and you said something, and I, I wish I could remember exactly what you said, but you said basically things came to you without you doing anything, which is the way it should happen. And I think so as well. It's the. It's like, I hope so because you were one who said it. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> but that was I. I read that today and I was like, oh, that's that's really zen. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It's the, like the will, the ability to let go and let things just happen, allow yeah. you to go the direction that maybe you should go. Well, I if you that look was at really interesting. you know everything you see, I say on TikTok, because TikTok is really the funnel of all great thought in this day and age. But if you look at everything, it's just let go. Let don't worry about yeah. money. Don't worry about these things. Mm. Yeah. You know, I believe that the universe is always looking out for you, right. right? And there was something that was really that's right before COVID. There's something that struck me. I always wanted to do an improv class, not because I wanted to do comedy, right? It's the is there something that can help my brain work faster? Because you know how you're like, I'll leave here and I'll be like, fuck, I should have said that, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that happens all the time. I was like. We exercise our body all the time. Yep. What do we do to exercise our brain? So I was like, I want to do an improv class. And then someone told me, you know, the whole principle of improv right. is yes and. Yes, that's exactly. all it is. Yes. And I was like, yes oh and. my God, that's yep. the universe. That right. is the philosophy of life. You should live yeah. by yes. And the second I realized that, yeah. and I realized how much that has really led my life and guided me, because it's always been like, oh, that seems interesting and fun. Yeah. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Rather than the... I say this and I actually will go back on that in a second, rather than the active pursuit of things. But then again, I would not be here if there wasn't drive and vision to doing certain things and putting myself in the right places. Mm -hmm. Some of it was the, you know, okay, we're going to New, we were in Atlanta working with 112 and 112 got signed to Bad Boy. So we're going up to New York to work for a month. And then, you know, when, yes, Puffy, when Puffy says, hey, um, I know you're going back to Atlanta, but you know, there's someone who does my programming, there's someone who engineers, someone who mixes, but you do all that. If you want to come up here, you just do all my stuff. So there was an active like, oh, I put myself in the right place, but there's a choice there to make. So I look back and I realize there were a lot of things where I made the active choice to be like, yeah. that's what I want. You know, I realized I had this crazy realization that I've only written down, up until the time I was about 44, I only ever wrote down two goals in my life like physically wrote down the goals and they were when I was 22. Hmm. Number one was work with Trent Reznor. Number two. Check, check. box checked. Number two was <laughs> run Geffen Records. Well. And there was a moment where I think I was on a bus with Nine Inch Nails in Europe, we were on tour and I was like, oh, even though we'd done social network and everything else, I was like, oh, this is Nine Inch Nails. I'm like, oh, I've done that. And then I realized when I did the She Wants Revenge record, and I went in and met the head of the label. I was like, oh, that's really, I don't want to do that. Yeah. I actually had a realization during COVID as well that I really messed up when I was younger because I thought I dreamt too small. The reality is you want to buy Geffen Records. You don't want to run Geffen Records. Right. And if we've learned anything about this time in COVID, it's the, whether it's the work from home aspect or you know, if you look at TikTok, where it is all people who are like, get out of the nine to five, here are situations where you can create your own reality and your own money and don't work for someone else. I realized that I was thinking way too small, but I didn't, that was the beginning of my learning how to visual, create a visualization that it's the, you know, I should have thought bigger. And that is the thing right now. If you could, if you know that you could come up with something and not fail, what would you do? You mm, know? Yeah. So question. what would you? So if that's the case, what would you do if you could do anything in the world right now and not fail at it? What would it be? We, we got some. We would eat. We would eat ice cream. We eat ice cream. <laughs> that's a great color. <laughs> that's that's the Cookie Monster. Cookie Monster. Cookie Monster. Uh, They're all going to Michael, and then we'll uh, <laughs> after he's done with pick. it, we'll cookie we'll dough. pick off it. That's vegan cookie dough. Road. Oh, we did have McCray Road, which is a street I grew up on here in Thousand Oaks. 
and that Butterfinger. Butterfingers. Off the Butterfinger. Okay, if I might make an observation. Yes, sir. The thing that I see that is really something that's lost in the Tarantula Hill world for me right now mm. is that I would like to see the ice creams match the colors. Like there should be the liquid candy hazy IPA, That's the brilliant. colors That's that a brilliant idea. even if it is a different thing, it relates yep. in some way. Because this is a beautiful color. Like I yep. saw this and it pops out. And then I was looking at what Josh did over here and I was like, oh, if there were a peachy orange thing and it was this, that's what I want to oh, see. Oh, so you want to see it on the, on the like, ice cream container? This looks like ice cream. This is this is special, right? Yeah. So how do you tie in so that everything colors. has? We need that. to make a liquid candy ice cream. I think the colors, though, is yeah, what the colors. Is what you're yeah, the colors. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the flavor is. It, I mean, it does in a way, but what are the the colors that kind of tie in? Because the colors are beautiful. Well, which I'll do. well, the flavor the flavors should should hopefully. Uh, oh wow, that's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> it is crazy, unfortunately, because you just want to keep eating it. But let's not skip the question. If you could do anything right now and you knew you would never fail, what would you do? So I just recently, I'm actually to the very near end of a book of one of my friends, Don Dapani, who was a Buddhist monk mm -hmm. for 10 years, then left the monastery, um, had him on one of my other shows. And the book is so tremendous about like really understanding how your brain works and the ability to concentrate and how to practice concentration. Honestly, the answer to that question right now, if, if I could do anything and be the best at it at this moment would be to be in the moment right now. Yeah. I mean, because that's I all we have. That is the most that's special it. gift we can possibly have. And yeah. one of the things I really took from the book is that every time that you're not present, you're wasting it. Yeah. You know, so that's everything is present is a present. Yeah, I mean, and and it just finally really resonated by reading that that yeah. his book. So, well, I think that goes into what you were saying earlier about what I said in the quote, which was, I think, all my life I've just been in the moment, and whether it's a zeitgeist where you just happen to end up in the right place, um, it is just being in the moment and not thinking too far ahead and planning. And I also realize there's an in between. You have to have that goal and that plan, but you kind of just you accept what's happening and in that moment of accepting the next thing is revealed yep. to you. If you could do anything, what would it be? And you weren't going to fail. This is great. <laughs> yeah, it is. I should have started thinking about when you were thinking about it because I didn't think it was going to put that on me. But um, that's a, that is a tough question. Um, um, I think maybe you're doing it. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I think <clears throat> it, there, there definitely is like a, <clears throat> you know, a manifesto in my mind of like you know all the things to come there's still a lot to do and then i'm just trying to you know work the pieces to make it all happen um i definitely have hopes for you know this podcast to do well and for this to lead to other things um the brewery is obviously absorbing a huge amount of my my bandwidth um and how to make this you know like my, my goal with this is to you know to make it a much, you know, at the moment, you know, in the world where, you know, we're doing really well, but mm -hmm. we're still a very small fish in a, in a very big pond, you know? So I want to be, I want to take this thing to another level. Um, and then uh, not to change the subject terribly, I think that's maybe enough, but, um, but well, going I'm going to comment on that in one second. Okay. So finish your thing first. Uh, back to your, to the, to the Buddhist thing um, or the monk thing. Um, that concept of like systems and repetitiveness and like you know that that like like uh um like that's kind of the concept in my mind of like what this you know what this this podcast is to bring us like these tools that we can you know you know talk about to, you know for other people to utilize or whatever but like um like in jiu-jitsu like we, you know the class you know they have multiple different classes but we you know the, the class that i particularly go to is the fundamentals class and I feel like um, you, you can. I feel like I can hang with anybody in the advanced class by just going to the fundamentals class. Because if your fundamentals mm -hmm. are solid, then yeah. you're solid. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you have a strong foundation in anything, and it's it's about reps. You know, it's like you master the fundamentals. Yeah. Yep, you're that's it. You know, and you look at like like why was Kobe Bryant better than anybody else? Because he sat there 
he got there an hour earlier or probably three hours early in his case you know got there earlier than everybody left later and did the same thing over and over and over and over again and like how to some people that's mind numbing but like that's that's what it takes to become elite there's a great moment from my life where I'm sitting there in the studio and Puffy's on the phone with Jay-Z and it's just the two of us and he's talking to Jay-Z and he just is like motherfucker the reason I'm going to win this game ahead of you is because I get up before you and I go to bed after you. Yeah. And if you take that extra little bit of time in your life and you apply it to the fundamentals, which he did, you can't lose, yeah. right? Because, you know, the fundamentals are the building blocks of everything. everything. And if you can have the extended experience and you have the, the extra advanced stuff, still, you're going to be in some situation where you just come back to fundamentals work. Yeah. And that's the key. Yeah. You know? And you need to know that stuff as well because someone's going to come at you with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I have but, to s- you know, you divert and then and then go back to the fundamentals. As I have another bite of this, what's this flavor again? That's Cookie Monster. This is so good. You got two more to, you got two more to try. I feel yeah. very John, we didn't get anything for you. I can I can I'll taste a little bit of that vegan uh, Oh, that's right. There is one yeah. vegan. I'm yes. I'm uh, I can't do is this dairy. one vegan. The irony of me making ice cream. No, the other one. But taste that one before you pass it off to me. The other one. Well, here. That's, uh, I'll give you this Yeah, give me the spoon. spoon. We got more oh, spoons. We got more spoons. I'll take my spoon. Yeah, yeah. The but here, taste this. This is vegan. That's that's vegan ice cream. It's coconut-based, basically, with, uh, with um, cookie dough. Oh, wow. Right? For like, wow. vegan, that's pretty on point, right? My girlfriend is mostly vegan. Um... I'm always shocked by what is good and what's bad. And I have to say, I hit a moment. There's a band that I'm working with. It's more of a 57-person art collective in Denver called Itchio. Um, <laughs> okay, that sounds It's crazy. incredible. It's amazing. We could do a whole podcast. It, it's unbelievable. And the last day we were there, we were at Scott's house, and we were kind of in the, the garage. We'd have been in the studio for a week and a half. And we just went there just to, like, bounce stuff and play around. He's like, hey, I'm going to make dinner. Does anyone want any food? I'm going to make some sausages. And we're like, yeah. And so makes it. It's great. And I'm like, you know, not thinking because I'm just, I'm working. But I'm like, this is really good. And the next day I w- <laughs> mentioned something. And I was like, yeah, the sausages are great. And he's like, yeah, it was impossible. Mm. And I'm like, it was that moment where your brain didn't realize that it was vegan and it wasn't meat and you completely accepted it where I was like, oh, we've come to this place where it's, you know, wow. it's yeah. on. It's, it's really, it's kind, it was kind of like, oh, that's a revelation. That, Before that, we, that's really it's good. so good, right? <laughs> so Before good. we go on too far into tangents, I also want to talk about the era of your life, which is Cloak & Dagger, mm-hmm. which I will say, for those who don't know about Cloak & Dagger, which probably a lot of people don't because... It was truly one of the, I lived in Hollywood for, I don't know. Uh, on Lexington? Selma. Selma. No, but I d- Oh, yes. I, yeah, I did I have an apartment that. on you, Lexington. You did, yeah. That's true. But I did also live on at the Selma place upstairs for many years. That's right. Um, I lived there for at least a decade, I would say. And then I lived in L.A. for 20 years. 30 years, I think. Jesus. Um, but anyways, I spent a lot of time there. I was in the mix. Cloak & Dagger was was one of the coolest clubs in Hollywood of all time, which is saying a lot because Hollywood has some very cool clubs. Um, this club was... Um, it was super underground. You had to be a member. I was fortunate enough to know Michael and, and get a membership. Hmm. Um, Adam was usually the DJ. Or if was he always the DJ? No, most not, most of the time. Almost every time. In almost the front every room time. And then the back room we had right, some right. other people. And Adam Adam is from She Wants Revenge, which is an amazing band. Um, he was an amazing DJ. Um, there were rules to get in here. You had to wear all black. There were no photos to be taken inside. Uh, what was the th- what was the other third rule? Uh, let's see. Um, you're Respect. responsible for your guest right. and don't go anywhere uninvited. Yeah. 
and then there may be one other, but that was pretty much it. Yeah. So, yeah, and there was, if you fucked up, your membership would be revoked. They did all the, all of, everything was through Instagram. So every week, you know, there were, you know, posts by Instagram. And there, there was a professional photographer inside that would take pictures if, you know, if you were cool with it. Um, so that, those were the pictures that would show up on the feed. Um, and then, um, um, it was, it was a goth club basically. Uh, I, I'm just, okay, sorry, sorry. No, no, you everyone <laughs> thinks it is because of the I all said, black. I said basically, Yeah. but basically, yeah. I mean, cause I, I mean, cause honestly, like, I think like right now we're going to, I'm going to have Josh in the editing basically flash up a picture of me in the seventh grade. This is before goth was a thing and I was a goth kid. And I wish I could show I every... Wanna, I want to see that photo so bad. <laughs> yes, you're going to see it. It's going to be in this episode. I don't want to see it, actually. That's interesting. You, you, could fla- you could flip every page of the seventh grade yearbook, and I was the only goth kid. What were you listening to at that time? <sighs> I mean, it wasn't goth. It wasn't called goth, right? But it was seventh like, you grade. know, it was Depeche Mode. Yeah. This was this was what, what year? Uh, I was... It was 80... So 86, I guess? 80, I would say 86. And what better place to be than here at that time wow. period? K-Rock, every, I mean, K-Rock, right. K-Rock was, this was on a center fire. fire. Yeah. It was Depeche Mode, The Cure. It might have been 85, 86. 80? Yeah, 85. It might have been even 84. I don't know. It might have been uh, 84, 80, yes. 84, 85. Yeah. And uh, I was like, I was at that point, you know, like the age group, whatever. I was the youngest kid in, in my class always. And then you know, going from sixth grade to seventh grade when like, you know, all every all the you know, all the boys hit puberty and I was a late bloomer, I was also younger, so I was you know there's a whole slew of things that went into the made, weirdness of my made you know, which, you goth. Which which made me goth made me very unique. There was also uh Heidi Hudson, shout out Heidi Hudson, who was like the hottest chick in the school and she was like a punk rock goth chick and and I think I, you know, looking back, I probably was just trying to get her to notice me. Yeah. Did she eventually? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, and uh, you know, so anyways, but so so that was, and then and then also at that time we had in Thousand Oaks they had the T.O. dances and the Borchard dances, which were like at the community centers, and that DJs and it was like the Smiths, you know, like I mean, and and it was mostly high school kids, but. We, for whatever reason, you know, us, the small group of people who were like, God, we like tapped into that. So I was going to these dances and I would see my sister and be like, don't, you don't know me, you know? <laughs> and my sister was super goth as well. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I was definitely the only person, it was, it was, it was brutal. It definitely led to many beat downs um, in my life at that age in my life, uh, which is probably why like, I ended up getting to like, you know, mixed martial arts later because yeah. I was. I was destroyed. And you know what? Listening to all the music you're influenced by and listening to the music you make, though, you know, you were able to take those and blend those in together into your own thing. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a huge, huge part of my life. Um, I was definitely the only boy wearing eyeliner. Let's put it that way. That that was, you were getting beat up for that in my school. Anyways, um, (laughs) which also will bring... You should do that here one night. Yes. (laughs) Which it, also he was a tattooed on actually. Yeah, which Duran Duran obviously was a huge part of my life. Which also would, we're we're definitely going way over here. But I would definitely want to ask you some questions about Duran Duran because they're there's only le- now. legends to me. Um, but anyways, um, <laughs> um, so um, anyways, I'm getting sidetracked. But so that was a huge, huge, huge part thing to me. And so going to going to this club was. Um, and I, again, like currently, I don't know what the word is. I, I, I apologize if goth is the wrong word because there was much more than that. There was witchcraft and, and all kinds of other really amazing things happening there. But, um, but yeah, to me, it was like, it was, it was amazing. I, and, uh, I would have, you know, friends come in from England and, and bring them there. And uh, there's so many cool, I mean, I'm one of my, one of my experiences was that we were standing outside uh, like smoking cigarettes, you know, hanging out with the with the bouncer or whatever, and the leads. And I was with some friends from England who were in a band. Uh, shout out to Idiom. Uh, and like the singer of AFI comes walking up, and he had he had like he had like a gray shirt on, and and the bouncer wouldn't let him in. <laughs> so he had to leave and go. And his friends 
came back like you know like this is the singer of AFI coming to this club whatever it was it was funny and he, he came back minutes later with a black shirt on they let him in or whatever but anyways so um tell us uh do you know why we made everyone wear all black no I don't it wasn't because of goth it was because in a dark venue if you're wearing all black you're just focused on the person and the conversation you're having in front of you right it takes out everything the yeah. person could be wearing thrift has. store clothes or Versace, right. but you don't know because you're just focused on the community and the person. Is it yeah. a and dark club? I mean, it was a dark It was very day. dark. Very so, dark. So it was just, like, it's all heads. All heads. It's, yeah. you know, there's red light, but for the most part, it was lit by candles. And it was red lights and candles. Yeah. yeah. Lots of candles. I n- I've never thought I would buy that many candles in my life, but you're, I did. You know, I was on your Instagram, and you're into candles and witchcraft. And yeah. What? Tell me about that. We we bonded over <laughs> candles too, because remember M and O was. Yeah. I had bought I had bought probably 500 Jesus candles, and there were you know it, it was on special nights where we those, light those them. glass ones. The glass ones. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Anyway, and and we had we had some candle lit studio sessions whatever but anyways by sorry. the way one very important tip for anyone who buys candles if you buy the dollar store candles and i learned this for me it's an aesthetic thing if you buy the white candles it has the upc code on it right but if you buy the jesus candles or any of those candles that are the plastic ones they have the upc code on them so if you just rip that off you have perfectly white candles and no. the day I realized that, I was like, oh, my God, this is like a cheat code to perfectly white <laughs> candles. There's nothing worse than UPC code on your, on your candle. The, so Adam and I actually talked about doing Cloak and Dagger because, you know, I'd done the She Wants Revenge records with Adam. Yeah. And, you know, he's a classic legendary DJ. And in my mind, one of the absolute best DJs in the world. I, he's legit. Like, my friend from New York um, who came into town who was Mr. Club Guy was like, you know what, there's something, you know, most DJs have that song and then they go into the next song, but there's something where your DJ in that two minutes in between is doing something that's creating music that no one's ever heard. Yeah. And the great thing about Cloak was, when we started it, <clears throat> we first talked about it, we talked about my youth. And my youth was, and his youth, was being 18 in Memphis and, you know, you could go out when you're 18 at that time and... There was a club, club called GDI's on the river, and it was a gay club. And then Monday night, they made an alternative night. The guy I knew was like, hey, can I have that night and just play alternative night? And at that time period, let's say it's 1988, um, it, what he played was Depeche Mode into NWA into all this other stuff, yeah. everything that couldn't could get played on the radio. And you're like, oh, that's really cool. And then you, pretty soon you heard you know, Nine Inch Nails was on the radio and all these things that came out of that. And, but there was this moment where all these things blended. You know, and for Adam, he was telling me about playing, you know, house parties when he was 15. And what was one of his stories where he was sitting there and some punks came up to him and was like, play some Dead Kennedy or something. And he didn't. And then they knocked over his turntable. And then he took a had a friend took him to go buy some punk stuff. So when they came up again, he could play stuff for him. And all of a sudden they protected him. And it was that thing of like going through, especially in the valley where he grew up at that time, of all different kind of music, music combining. And for me, you know, when I was 18, I was in the studio doing drug dealer hip hop in the day and going to the goth club at night. So we were talking about that mutual interest in what we came to was a night of dark music of any genre. Because right? yeah. even Britney Spears, when you listen to some of the lyrics, it's really fucking dark. Mm-hmm. Right. And so... Adam's genius of combining these worlds, you know, he, de- he was Prince's DJ, he was Obama's DJ, he had a great night, he brought back um, with his partner Brian uh, Giorgio's, which was disco, and just a great, tasteful person. We were like, oh, we should do this, and this is maybe 2012. And I was dating a woman, and I was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this night, and she's like, look, I dated the biggest promoter in New York in 91, and I'll never do that again. And I was like... <laughs> Okay, I respect that. I'm in love. Let's not do it. And then later on it came up again, and we were like, okay, how do we do it in a different way? Still dark music of any genre. And the great thing about it would be, and it was one of my favorite things in the world, you'd see um, the black guy who was into hip-hop kind of being bored in the corner with his girl, right? And then all of a sudden, Adam would do some transition over two minutes, and about halfway through, 
you'd see his it click in his brain. Like, oh. Oh, damn, that's I, Jay-Z. I recognize what's going on. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you'd see him be like, and yeah. by, five minutes later, he'd be like, this is the best club ever. Yeah. And the same thing, where someone would be listening to Jay-Z, and all of a sudden, there'd be some transition. And he'd be like, oh, that's Christian death, and freak out and be like, this is the best thing ever. And the tra- the dark music of any genre, you know, I'm a firm believer. There's a great quote by one of the best philosophers of our time, Aleister Crowley, which is, the colors are many, but the light is one, Right. If we look at religion, whatever else, there's the source, and then everything is filtered in the colors, right? But it all comes from the same place, you yeah. know? Music comes from the same place, everything. So for me, that idea of being able to blend any kind of music um, was really interesting. Mm. And then very quickly, we started out in a basement at the Pig and Whistle, which is a place that no one had an idea that we were in because they came in the back way and no one had really ever been to the Pig and Whistle, who was part of our crowd. And we were in the basement, and then, without giving away too much, there was a way that you became a member, and that kind of quickly became something where people were like, oh, there's something dark and mysterious going on here. And then one day, I was sitting there, and you know maybe there were seven booths, and I'm looking, and every single booth was the leader of a different discipline of magic in a spiritual way. And I'm like, oh, there's something going on here that I feel that these people are being attracted to in some kind of way. Mm. And then it just kind of grew from there, where we went upstairs and then we, you know, for the most part, if you were cool, you'd be like, ah, okay, you could be a member. And then we ended up like, we started spending so much money on our cast and employees to do all of the magical stuff and started to do public rituals of like, Johnny, you are you like this kind of magic and you're a leader of that, why don't you lead a little magical thing for our people and that's a very basic way to explain it and then it just kept growing and eventually you know we were doing nights in Chicago and Mexico City and it became this weird world of music and magic in a I say spiritual way but not spiritual but like you know we think about the magical disciplines of the world of candle magic and everything else and you know probably the thing I what's, think what's your definition of magic um I feel there's a great quote from Crowley that I can't remember right now, but um, I don't want to say manipulating energy to uh, create the vision. I mean, there's a lot of different ones. For me, it is putting your will out to the world and creating a vision for the world you want and then doing things in whatever the way. It could be rituals. It could be um, there's a jiu-jitsu meditation. There could be something where it centers you and puts your your mind is in a space to create the vision that you want that will come to you in waves of the future. Mm. I'll tell you the way that it came across as the... uh, I do have a... Tell me if I'm wrong. Remember that... Oh, no. Here it is. Magic is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with the will. That is the quote. That is the quote. you know, the great thing about that is, you know, that could be... um, that can be interpreted in many, many different ways. Yeah. You know, whether it is, you know, there's a another quote that I'm going to get wrong that is basically like, you know, you do certain things in certain orders, you get certain reactions, right? You do 10,000 free throws at the free throw line, you're good at something, right? Yeah. And we also don't know why there are certain things in the world that we do that we put things out and we do certain things, candle magic, whatever that may be, and there's a result that happens, right? There's a result that happens if you're aware and if you're looking for that. And, you know, we can, you know, there's a, science can be debatable at times if there is science, but there is a, you know, if you look at Kabbalah from the voice of God to Abraham's ear and moving something forward in a spoken from me to you and passing that along, there are things that that work. Mm -hmm. And there are things once you start to see signs, you start to see that there are things throughout culture and there are things that, uh, that align people and within cloak there were people who would come and be like wow i was always a solo practitioner of magic but now i've met other people and i'm practicing with other people because just like you know going to church where you were doing magic with a group you know in a ceremonial way like there's energy there there's energy that as a group can can grow and become more powerful it was a very and i'll be very vague on all the rest of the stuff (laughs) it was a it was a very sort of church-like experience is what I was going to say. Like, mm. um, but Influenced by immersive theater as well, like Sleep No More. 
the aspect of the magical stuff, I think, was also pushed forward even more because of the immersive theater aspect that we brought in, being influenced by Sleep No More. Yeah. So and things like that. Yeah, it was very it was very theatrical. You would kind of like in the in the original days, like you're saying, you'd go in the basement. The uh, the uh, the door person was uh, this like beautiful trans person. Um, Diana. Yes. Drag queen. Love Diana. Super super drag queen, and like that was so that you walk up and like she's running the show and and you know getting you know getting you through the whole thing and and. Um, and it was—it definitely felt like there was some sort of almost like satanic ritual happening in there, the vibe. And then, uh, as they evolved, like you said, when they when it started to go to the upstairs, um, there would you would just be kind of you'd be kind of hanging out, and some like beautiful girl would like that looked like kind of almost like a fairy or something would just come up to you and just start kind of like dancing with you, whatever. And you're like, oh, what what's happening right now? And then she'd be like, come with me, and she would take you into another room and you're like this is crazy so that was the uh, that, and that explains what I the one of the rules that I didn't understand don't go was it don't go where you weren't invited? invited exactly yeah. yeah so there were areas <laughs> yes exactly and then and then they would sit down with you but then they would kind of uh, I mean I, w- I was someone's gonna get their membership revoked oh yeah I'm not supposed to talk about it jeez sorry no, anyways just, they yeah. would they would uh, things are you, you would think where this is going <laughs> somewhere where it's it's not trust me it, it was they would kind of give you almost like, uh, you know, like an energy reading. You know, it was like, um, I don't know exactly, I can't, I can't. Things to, uh, I, uh, you know, in our mind, I think there's a spirituality aspect that gets lumped into that. But it's like, in the end, things to allow you to be your best and creative self. Mm. To make you think about what's going on in your life and, uh, you know, change or get results in whatever way. Yeah, they Just would ask you, you questions. They would ask you questions, like deep, you know, like very thought provoking. And then like you'd sit there and be like, there, I remember there was one time I think I went into a room with a woman and like she had like. I've got to look up his member member. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. Am I really not supposed to be talking about this? No. Okay. No. No, tell me to stop. stop. I mean, some people would <laughs> say that Cloak and Dagger is no more, but uh, once a member, always a member. Okay. Johnny. I still have my membership, Treadline. but I guess I'm not supposed. I guess I didn't know. I didn't know we were supposed to not talk about it on this level. I think but that was one of the rules as well. Sorry. It's so okay. I'll it's like change. I'm totally I'm fucking blowing this. I'm gonna I'm gonna change it, it is like. Bike <laughs> <bike>. Anyways, <laughs> no, that's all I right. just, I just, okay. I, I'll stop. I won't talk about the details anymore. But like, it, you know, even that stuff. I mean, the, the t- like, Adam is literally like, a, a, like a brilliant, brilliant DJ. Like, I mean, the the. You know, like dan- just just going in there and dancing and like and um, you know, again for me, like it meant a lot to me because the the music that he was playing again, like lots of lots of like heavy dark hip hop, which is the hip hop that I love, and then you know dark like you know Nine Inch Nails and Depeche Mode, The Smiths, all that stuff was happening, and so it it was like that in itself to me was like a, a religious experience, um, and then uh, you know and then all this other stuff. Yeah, I'm sorry, I I didn't mean to put that, but but. The, but what you guys put together, like the, th- like, uh, what you curated, right? Yeah, they curated this very special yeah. thing that was like an experience. You know, you get tired of going, you go to clubs and there's a DJ and then that's the same thing and some, you know, 25 year old kids spilling drink on you and people are stepping on your brand new shoes. It's just like, get the fuck, I, I just want to get out of here, you know? That experience, or this, this experience was, was very unique very exclusive very you know i don't know it, what you guys put together was 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 really amazing well, i think that's the beauty as well of being able to hand pick everyone who's in there yeah because you know the adam said something really great which is everyone who's in the room needs to bring something to the conversation and that doesn't have to mean like a talking it could be a fashion yeah it could mean music they have to bring something that adds to the conversation in a way that when you see the person, you talk to the person, you're informed in a different way, and the combination of that, all those people in a room, means that you know, you're know you in a very, very special place. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, there's an aspect of people letting people into clubs because of money or they're buying bottles, but you couldn't do that. It yeah. was, for better or for worse, mine and Adam's decision on what's going to, is that person gonna bring something to the conversation that is beautiful? 
mm. you know, and it, that doesn't have to do anything about looks as well. Mm. It just is, is there something that's going to inform other people's lives to become the, their best and most creative self? Yeah. Like and that's that. really the, the, the decision. And mm-hmm. I think for the most part, with some minor exceptions, I think that, you know, I saw a lot of the people last night, because for the first time since COVID, Adam DJed a kind of dark night. And it was great to see everyone and just be like, the, the reaffirmed like, oh, these are all great people. We built a great community. Right. And they, yeah. you know, and that's yeah, what we did. I feel like you had a real, real clarity on your why. Yeah. Why you were doing it. Yeah. yeah. I, and you know, it's funny, I think, there's, as, you, as we all know, you get into certain things and you go with the flow. And then all of a sudden the why comes out of it. It unfolds, you right? don't You do it for one reason, like, oh, this would just be cool, this would be fun. Right. The, and then all of a sudden, certain things happen, you start to bring in other, other elements and you're like, oh, there's something different going on here than I thought it was, but it's along the lines of things I like, how do we, how do we now move that along? You yeah. know, and it, it, it informs you, you don't inform it. Right. Mm-hmm. I see that with this podcast too. And part of the, I think the why, why we're doing this is to like pull out those, those like golden nuggets, those life lessons. Yeah, those, absolutely. The, like something that w- someone can share. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to put you on the spot. Me or Michael? Michael. Okay, good. What, what is, what is one of the things like just throughout your life that you've gone through and you, you named a few already, but like something you'd love to tell your like 18 year old self. Other than don't <laughs> sell the Bitcoin when you buy it, right? Um, would be <laughs> life lesson. Like, trust yourself; you're doing the right thing. Like I think that is in the end, the times where I've questioned myself have been the times where you've had the greatest, like, oh wow, I really messed that up. Mm. Instead of just going through gut, because your gut's never wrong. I mean, I'd like to say that I'm right more often than I am not, and the you know the, the issue with with me is activation on the the feelings of being right. But just to, you know, your gut is right, you know, and spend more time with your family. <laughs> I like that. You know, how about you? Uh, I wasn't ready for that next okay. question. <laughs> when people ask me, like, when I'm like, what are you listening to? I'm, they ask me that back, and I, I really, my mind blanks. You Even know, that, though I've listened to tons of stuff coming, I, I can't think, remember. I think you just thing. gave the answer to that. I listen, I'm listening to myself. <laughs> well, that's the, the, the <laughs> right? because of the book you're reading. And when you tune in via meditation. You what, start to hear yourself. What I'm listening to right now is uh, the new uh, second half of the double album of the Red Hat Chili Peppers. Mm. How is it? So this is a question I wanted to ask you. This will be like a bite on the outside because we went really long here. But like for me, when I listen to new music, I'm, now that I'm older, I understand like how I need to listen to something. And so as a producer, engineer, and mixer, I'm really curious your thoughts on this. Like. Typically, when a double album hit when I was younger, like in my 20s, that'd be the end of that band. A double album would come out, I'd be absorbed with so much music that I'd be like, I'd almost tire of them. Mm -hmm. Um, I think an example would be Smashing Pumpkins. Mm -hmm. Huge Smashing Pumpkins fan. Smashing Pumpkins comes out with a double album. It was just like too much, and I don't know if there's an album that came out. I feel like bands, typically when they're on course, every two years, an album would come out for me. That's kind of like my pace that worked really well for me. Like I would stick with them. I'd evolve with them. Just real quick before you move on. Yeah. If that's true, what happened to you with the Smashing Pumpkins and you didn't get to a door? Have you ever listened to a door? That might've been the album that was after the (laughs) the album. a A door to me is a fucking masterpiece. It's one of the most underrated albums of all time. If you didn't give it a shot, give it a shot. Another question. Sorry. Continue. And and not not mad at that. Okay. At a door. So there's a bunch of questions I have for you within this kind of little thought I have, but like one with Rick Rubin when he did Imagine Dragons and he did the double two double albums six months apart. Seems like it's something you can do easier now. When the Chili Peppers came out and I knew they were working with Rick Rubin, I thought when the first one was released, I'm like, man, I hope there's another album coming out six months later. I don't know if that's just easier to do now or it's working because of digital or whatever that might be. So then they release it. Now that answer your question, like how I have to listen to music now, I only can take like four or five tracks at a time. Right. And this is the problem with our minds right now. And so I take four or five and I need to go over those multiple times until I really understand what I'm listening to. Right. And then maybe I can move on. Now, one of the problems I'm having with digital music is that 
when an album's coming out, they'll release a song and they'll release another song, and it ruins the album for me because I can't help myself from w- wanting to listen to those songs. Right. And now I can't appreciate the album because when I I listen to those songs 40 times before the album comes out, now the album comes out. When I'm listening to the album, I'll skip those songs. You know, when I just before COVID, I got my turntable fixed, and it was actually a revelation because. I would put on albums and listen to the whole album. And I would get to songs I hadn't heard in a long time. Because mm. on streaming, I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen to that song over and over. And it's such a different mindset on how we listen to music now. Uh, and we're all scatterbrained anyway. Right. The To go back for a second, there's an album that I just mixed for a band called Unloved. And they do all the music for Killing Eve. It's amazing, but it's a double album. And we finished the double album. And then they did another album, which comes out at the end of the year. And it's interesting because you think, okay, that's 22 songs. That's a lot of songs. That's a lot of songs. But as I listen to it, I'm like, all of these songs are great songs. Like, they work, and whether or not, you know, other people will see that or appreciate it or like it. But for me, it was like, okay, this works as a Del album. That, oh, that doesn't happen all the time. When I think about mm. Pumpkins, it worked. You know? It's a lot of music. In, oh, and that was a great day, album. A great album. And, but it also almost maybe tired you from getting to adore you know, which right. Johnny loves. Right. So, you know, is it... When you mix songs, mm-hmm. or when you're working with developing a song, let's say, yep. is there any thought of that going into it? Like, are people going to hear this for what it really is? Are people... It doesn't matter. You work on the song as its own pace, as its, as its own piece, and you don't care about the end result. Your job is to make it the best it can be, and then your job is to... How does it fit into this album? And then mm. is this is it eleven songs or is it forty songs? Right. Each that, song stands. That on was the other question I had for you is like, what's your definition or what's what's success for you when you're working on a song, individual song? What's success for you? Like, how do you define that? That I love it and can listen to it over and over. It's a tough one because there are songs that I love that other people don't, and they're you know at the point when you're list you know. Is it a number one song? I mean, that's a great litmus test, but think of all the albums that are great albums that just have great songs. You right. know? And I, for me, it's like, can I listen to the song over and over? Okay. And do I listen to it over and over? And at the end of a record, after hearing it thousands of times, am I still engaged by it and love it? Hmm. You know? So I always think of like, I mean, I think 90% of Minister Sobriety OPM is a hit. And I say that because they're all catchy songs that work for me, and I'm like, oh, that's a hit. Right. You know? And whether it's a commercial single or not, it's like, is it a hit to me? Yeah, I, I love it. So I think it's, you know. Do you ever I, feel like you have to commercialize a song? It happens, but it only happens because, like, you want it. It's never a, and I guess it happens all the time. But it's never like, we have to do these things to make it a hit. Right. It's like, oh, this is what I would enjoy. Because in the end, it's like, oh, I love this or not. Right. Is that good or bad? Yeah, my, for me on that one, like, if you're not trying to make, I don't, I mean, like, like it's If it's you're easy. on the Lakers, you want to win the championship. Yeah, that's right. If and you're that's gonna, how you should approach everything you get in signed, your life. If you get signed, if, like, if your goal is to go and you get signed to a record label, and you're not trying to make, uh, if you got to put, 12 songs on a record you're not trying to make every one of those a hit then what are you doing yeah you know like if you're not like and whatever if that means commercial whatever like if you're if you're trying to go out of your way to make things that aren't commercial then you're a hobbyist yeah you know like you should just you should just i, d- I don't understand like indie bands who their guitars are out of tune it's yeah. all, almost uh, like it's an uh, intentional because it's so easy to do it right it's more right. like we're spiting yeah. the world mm. and you you know whether or not some like, people do like try to create something that's so selfishly for themselves though that is brilliant and then people understand it though right like, and but that's like okay. give me what, like but what's an example of that like what's an example like i think like you're talking about the out of tune thing where like it's like it's just that's it, if you like if, spite. if you went <laughs> if you went and you kept listening to her eventually you would condition your ear to hear it and be okay with whatever but like we've all sort of agreed upon what tuning is and we're all going to agree that that's you know like they're like you know you we've agreed on certain parameters i have a caveat to this okay because that would really annoy me i'm like just yeah fucking tune your guitar yes right. but i have to say that we've been lucky how we've recorded right when i think about budgets i don't think about budgets right 
because for the most part, either I had my own studio where it was more about time, mm -hmm. or you having your own studio where you're like, we can do our thing and get it right. Yeah. But I, you know, I just did something where we were in the mountains in Colorado, and the the guitarist, the band had never recorded. I say properly. They are kind of always recorded together, and they had two days, right? Mm. And the guitar that the guitarist had wouldn't stay in tune. And I'm like, that's not in tune. And they're like, well, it sounds fine to us. And I'm like, but it doesn't sound fine to me. Where I realize that for them, that's fine. And with the limited budget they had, that they would have been fine with that and come out with it, and I would have been really annoyed hearing that. But, you know, I have to be, it's like the old... Uh, um, Fuck, what's the phrase where it's like teachers, if you don't teach, you sell kind of thing. Where it's like, oh no, there's actually um, those who can do, those who can't like teach or something. Okay. Or sell where you're like, Those who oh, teach no. can't do? Yeah. Where you're that's like, oh no, that's valid. And I also understand that people don't have the same budgets that, or the time that we would have in a studio to do stuff. And they're limited by the quality of gear they have. So I've been a little less harsh about that. Hmm. And yeah, I understand but that, but still... You should, you know what it should sound like. You yeah. should be prepared having your stuff together. Right. Yes. So. But you think about like so the, the perfect example of what you're talking about is Jamaica. You know, you know pre Bob Marley, right? Yeah. Can tell me stuff. Like yeah, like when when on that when on the island there was like one keyboard and one guitar and one bass and you know, there was like one of everything and they all were kind of sharing the whole thing, whatever. And they were, and they were attempting to make R and B records and they invented something, mm -hmm. right? But they still, you know, like, they weren't, you know, they, they were, they acknowledged that the wheel is round and it rolls, like they weren't trying to re reinvent right. that, right? right? But in, in, in effect, they re they did invent something. They yeah. invented a genre, yeah. um, you know, or whatever. Like you think about like, you know, any, any, like you look at like Black Sabbath, like, you know, basically inventing heavy metal because they were trying to, they were trying to make, you know, the soundtrack. They were trying to make rock songs that were like the soundtrack to a horror movie. No. But like, um, they still followed the parameters. You know what I mean? Like, you you could you could try to reinvent the wheel, but you know you're just wasting your time. You just have a clunky car. You know what I mean? Like, well, this is the problem with the, the making music today. I'm sure Josh can appreciate this and making music, because I'm sure you do. Um, the the way that we are, and Johnny can as well, you can relate, I think, in a probably different way. Because of how we're going with the digital world, the mistakes are not obvious, right? If you're in a console and you're plugging the things in, all of a sudden you're like, oh, fuck, I plugged it that night. There's this weird, crazy distortion and such. It's harder to create these things by mistake than right. ever, and I think right. that's actually a problem, is right. we're, taking, we're mm -hmm. taking out from all things right. the the making the mistake to create something new. Right. In a, what's the uh, the little bit of chocolate that falls in the peanut butter and the guy's like, oh, that's yeah. good. Like, we're taking that out from the creative process right. through like, I'm drawing on my iPad, mm. means I'm not spilling ink on something and like, oh my God, what's going on? Like the, tool, right, like, the tools like, uh, are too easy. Like, exactly. Yeah. Like Ike Turner invented distorted guitar, correct? Because mm -hmm. there was a an amp with a speaker and this somebody you know kicked a hole into the speaker and then they played it and it was and then that was yeah, like, the oh, invention that of the awesome. yeah. <laughs> Those but yeah, kind like of things on the computer to not gonna happen yeah, yeah. Mm. so this is the you know pushing things forward so much of pushing things forward is in by accident yeah exactly know? and even in a magic happy way, accidents that happy was one accident. thing that 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 michael coined that term when we were doing the record which I, which stuck me forever was going back to like you know him being the director we were recording and you know you would do you know we would do this it would do kind of the take over and over and over and it would be the same every time and then there would be one mistake that would work right that was the one he would pick happy accident that's that one's staying in and i you know obviously remember like for me i would be like yay happy accident and then remember uh matthew definitely didn't respect no 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 we gotta do it 10 more times we gotta do it 10 more times. it's gonna be the you know whatever and that was well, I find one that of the differences in our personalities. I, I find that's one of the hacks I use in the creative process is sometimes someone's misunderstanding or even my misunderstanding in a conversation. And I'm like, oh, wait, I thought you meant this, but oh, wait, that actually might work. What do you think yeah. of that idea? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like that misunderstandings is that kind of happy accident. Yeah. What is the happy accident when it comes to brewing beer? Um, 
I, I imagine they happen a lot. Um, there is like brewing beer is definitely it's an art form for sure. Um, for sure. But um, once you come up with you know the brand or whatever, like then now it's about consistency. So in the you know in the R and D department or whatever, like you know they're they're super you know experimental to trying new things and, and mixing things this that and the other for example um one of our beers uh was called accidental log accidental amber lager basically the recipe called for 40 percent of a malt that was like a like a honey malt and then uh 60 or i think it was 60 percent honey malt 40 percent dark malt and they screwed up on the recipe and did it reverse so that it, they were doing a, a you know a lager and it ended up coming out dark right and then um so they actually even ended up calling it accidental amber lager and then we took that beer to lagerville which is a um like a california you know lager contest where we're an ipa brewery mostly just because we don't have the real estate to do lagers we would do more if we could but we can't how much more real estate do you need you just need a lot of space. The loggers, lo like IPAs take 10 to 14 days and loggers mm -hmm. take 30 to 60 days, right? Okay. So we're trying to turn it over faster to survive. If we were, you know, if you're Budweiser or, or Coors Light or Coors, you know, basically you have all the real estate and the time in the world, they can, those are loggers. Um, anyways, though, we, you know, we ended up winning the, the logger competition for that beer. So a happy mistake. Happy, happy mistake. mistake. Yeah. You know, the, what I think, find interesting about your, the Buddhist meditation things that you're going through is the idea of, you know, in a Carl Jung kind of way, like all of our subconscious, you know, it works at a, at a very subconscious level and it comes through images and things like that. And when you quiet the mind, all, all of a sudden, you know, everyone's, what's the Jack Dorsey thing? If medit meditating were easy, you would never stop, right? But when you quiet your mind, all of those little things that connects the dots or the happy accidents that aren't really happy accidents because your subconscious is telling you come up and that's the aha moment. Right. It's just quieting your mind to do that. Or they, um, they say your conscious mind will actually tune in your unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. If you're yeah, yeah, they work that's hand a in gift hand. If you're able to tap that. Yeah, right. And it's it's you know, it's hard. It takes it, it seems like sitting there and unfocusing your mind is something that should be easy but it's not yeah. you know one the monkey mind always wants to wants to keep going right. but the unconscious mind is where the the all the the connection is made it's the uh you know i don't know if you do this or not but before before you go to bed you know put out a thought to your brain a problem that you want to have solved and you'll find out a lot of times when you wake up it's solved because your subconscious brain will then work on it you know during mm. the seven half hours while you're asleep like our Wait, you don't wake up at three in the morning and can't fall back to sleep like me? <laughs> Dude. Nah, that's a sign of depression, they say. Oh, I'm, I'm not depressed. I'm just, <laughs> I seem to wake up at three o'clock for some well, reason. Well, the question is, why? And I have a friend who does that. You know, there was the time period in society, and I'm going to make up this number and it's going to be wrong, 1742, where people woke up at three o'clock and they went back to bed at four. And in that time period, they went and visited neighbors like everyone did this. Like, if yeah. you look at it, there's a, there's a <laughs> time period this. in history. I, I, I think I read about this. Yeah. And I have a friend who does that. She's like, I just realized I was waking like up they, at 3 o'clock and I, I use it. Yeah, exactly. They have parties, right? Yeah, people do the lights on and you're walking through your neighborhood. My friend is like, I wake was it up at in 3 o'clock. South America? Where was it? I think Europe. I think, I think was it, it was a... It's one of those things, much like if you read the book Sex at Dawn, which discusses all weird stuff, where they found that... People in Africa and South of America were doing the same things, even though there's no way that they could connect that, right? Oh, wow. In the idea of, and it's kind of fascinating, when the woman was pregnant, they would, she would have sex with the different members of the village because if she wanted to be stronger, she would have sex with the the fighters, or if she wanted to be smarter, she had more sex with the the priest. And they found the same thing after the child was born, they would share birthing duties and milking duties depending on what they wanted more of the child to be because they had no idea. And then they found in Africa they were doing the same kind of thing, hmm. which is just bizarre. And that's the fascinating thing as well when you see that in different places in different times, the same thing happening in whatever universal collective consciousness, right? In Seattle, there was some music going on. In Atlanta, there was some music going on. And you're like, oh, it's related, but they had no way to find out. It's just like yeah. people are making music that way. and whatever you know wow. limitations are good in wild 
All right. Cheers. 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 Thank you so much for joining us. It was Thank a, you. That was amazing great. conversation. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor knowing you. Absolutely. And I, I, you know, I mentioned this to Johnny earlier when we think about we're all young, right? When we think about how much we've been through in our life and knowing that we have 40 more years to go, all of the amazing things that will happen. And I have to say one last thing. There was a moment where I was at Cloak and Dagger and I'm like dancing and I'm like, wow, my 18 year old self would love this. And then Adam played a song I mixed. And I was like, I'm in my club hearing a song I mixed <laughs> from a important time period. And I think about um, the show I couldn't come to. The, sh the OPM show was here in the back. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So here you are blending both of those worlds yeah. into like, think of how many people never get to do something like that. Yeah. Like, it's pretty amazing. And there's something interesting one last thing that you were, we were talking about earlier about COVID and the people who succeeded and did it, right? We know now there's no middle class, there's no upper class, and there's no lower class at all. There's only two classes now that you should think about. There's the ascending class and the descending class. That's how you have to think about how to separate what's going on in the world, right? And it's the Frankie Goes to Hollywood lyric, shooting stars never stop even when they reach the top, right? People who have had success in their past will continue to have success because there's the idea of momentum. You performing with your band hit songs that the world accepts as hit songs at your brewery that you created with other people out of your mind is unbelievable. And when you think about what you're going to do in the next 30 years beyond that, it's amazing. Like, yeah. we're all looking, we're all ascending people in our lives, and like, it's only going to be good. Yeah. Awesome. And Thank it's an you honor so much. To be here. Thank you.